today and uh, and to hear about your research. But before your presentation, we like to do kind of an informal discussion and interview, I guess, of sorts to get a sense of your background, your interests, your career path, maybe some your some of your thoughts and perspectives on kind of the future of the field. So um, just as context, I think everybody knows this, but uh, I was very fortunate to have uh, Nanshu as a Beckman postdoctoral fellow in my group when I was back at University of Illinois. I think that was from 2009 to 2011. Is that right, Nanshu? Yes. Somewhere there. Yes. <laughs> and so I've known, known Nanshu for a very long time. She was spectacularly successful in my group and you know, opened up new research directions for us and then subsequently moved to her current position on the faculty at University of Texas at Austin. So, so Nanchu, may, maybe we could start by, um, you know, hearing from you how, how you got uh, interested in, in science and engineering and maybe your um, childhood, you know, experiences that maybe uh, led you down this career path and maybe just some background ar around how, how you grew up and, and how you got, got started in this field. Sure, sure, yeah. So um, I uh, grew up in Chengdu, uh, Sichuan, China. So uh, it's a city uh, uh, considered the hometown of panda bears and uh, hot pots. So um, my family uh, actually are well educated. Both my parents are college graduates. And um, I remember that um, my dad is uh, very handy. Uh, he actually assembled his own radio uh, when he was young by just collecting a lot of uh, uh, garbages considered at that time. And uh, when I was in uh, elementary school, we also had uh, science fairs. Those are very rudimentary science fairs. And um, my father um, actually uh, helped me a lot during those uh, hands-on experience. And I still remember the um, satellite model we built together. And we did struggle with the solar panel because it's so thin and so flappy and we have to add skeletons to make it uh, able to deploy. So um, as I grow up, I. Uh, constantly uh, actually go back to my dad to ask him for inspirations, ideas, and that has been a like, non-depleting source of uh, motivation and inspiration for me. Uh, after I joined Tsinghua, um, I uh, was in the engineering and mechanics department. And at that time, not uh, a lot of us uh, made that choice as our first choice. A lot of my classmates are actually um, put into this program after uh, the university's adjustment. But mechanics was my first choice. Why? I didn't know what was mechanics, but when my parents uh, consulted, actually a professor Wei Yang in, um, on Tsinghua campus, actually, he he uh, mentioned that, oh, mechanics is everything. It's math, it's physics, it's computer science, um, and uh, it can be um, broadened into unlimited subjects. And uh, that really motivated my parents to uh, sign me up for engineering mechanics. And I liked uh, math and physics. I had very good teachers uh, in my high school in Shuda high school, so um, I didn't uh, really uh, object. And <clears throat> after I joined Tsinghua, um, I realized it's actually uh, true. We have to study the math at the math department level. We have to study physics at the physics department level. It's very rigorous uh, business, and it's very hard. Um, we had very few girls in our um, college, um, in our department. And my parents, in one of those like uh, parent meetings with the department chair, my parents asked Professor Wei Yang, so there are so few girls, should we be concerned? And Professor Wei Yang said, indeed, uh, we have very few girls in mechanics because it's really, really tough. 
all I can tell you is no matter how few the girls are, uh, in every class, um, there's always a girl in the top three. <laughs> <laughs> and my parents like, okay, so, uh, but we're not sure if Nishu is able to make it, but it turned out I made it. So, um, and I uh, was very fortunate to have the recommendation from Professor Wei Yang, and I joined uh, Zhigang's group at Harvard. Uh, extremely fortunate to uh, be able to have this experience and um, be able to work with extraordinary, extraordinary minds. And, um, but of course, when you are surrounded by extraordinary minds, you have this imposter syndrome, whether I belong here. So <laughs> there were struggles uh, and uh, uh, inconfidence. Um, but I think uh, my experience at Harvard uh, laid all the foundation for both uh, theory and experiments. Um, and after I got my PhD from Harvard in 2009, uh, actually Xuan He uh, asked me, Nashu, there is this wonderful Beckman Fellowship and uh, you want to go to Illinois because my um, boyfriend was at Illinois. Uh, why don't you apply for it? I was like uh, not aware of it, but I know John. So I said, yes, Illinois is my dream school, not just because of my husband, but also because <laughs> of John. <laughs> so, so I uh, contacted John, I reached out, and um, I was uh, uh, very, very honored that John immediately replied, yes, you're welcome to apply for the Vaccine Fellowship. So uh, I know it was very competitive. If I don't get it, I probably would just go to industry, uh, but I, I got it and that changed my whole career. Um, so I joined Illinois. I met another group of extraordinary people, including uh, Dae Hyung here. Um, <laughs> Koji was my uh, junior at Harvard. Dae Hyung has been a mentor, a collaborator, and a lifelong friend uh, starting 2009. And um, it was just a, a very <laughs> adventurous journey, but I, I'm very, very um, fortunate to have met so many uh, great mentors and also at UT so many great students. That's great, Nanshu. So, so you covered a lot of ground. So let me kind of go back a little <laughs> bit and ask you a few questions. But before I do that, I think you're expressions of uh, the love of mechanics, you, you know your audience in a sense, because uh, you know this is a mechanics group, so they love to hear that you have passion for mechanics. So, <laughs> so ni nicely done. So so I, I know that you've kind of um, straddled the boundary between experimental science and, and, and theory, and it sounds like your, your childhood, you know, you were kind of immersed in maybe the experimental side of uh, of you know scientific research in a sense, and maybe piqued your interest you know around radio construction and things like that, and then maybe at Tsinghua it became a little bit more focused on on theory is kind of what I'm hearing, and then at Harvard you had a blend, and then Illinois maybe a little bit more experiment, and now you've been able to integrate both aspects of uh, scientific research into your own independent programs, and so. How do you think about the kind of the balance there? And, and you seem to be very talented at both aspects, but uh, for maybe younger faculty who are looking to build, you know, robust programs of research, what, what would be your, your advice and, and your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's always tough to balance. I cannot say I balance it well, even nowadays, um, but I think, um, as many of you actually taught me, uh, we are driven by vision and mission. Um, so um, I will share my vision, <laughs> whether you agree or not, but uh, we, I am driven by that mission. So if you see I'm working on a lot of electronics, uh, sensors, devices, it's not because I don't love mechanics, it's because I want to pursue my vision. Um, so I think early on, uh, it takes time to uh, build it, but the best way is to read and to discuss with the best minds. I discussed a lot with Sehyang, especially when I started. 
um, collaborate with the, the best people and um, also um, uh, don't give up. You will have a lot of uh, uh, failures and frustrations along the way and you constantly doubt yourself, right? Like when you get your reviews back, like is it really a garbage I'm producing? <laughs> is this really a bad idea I'm proposing, right? So all of us go through this. But if the good thing of having a vision uh, is that you will never be lost. Uh, you know uh, you are doing uh, what you love and you are marching towards uh, your own goal. Um, success is hard to measure. Different people have different measures for success, but you know how to um, evaluate yourself where you stand. Uh, I think that takes time. Um, but uh, as we become more older and more mature, it will become more obvious. Yeah, great. Th those are really interesting and valuable thoughts to share. So I appreciate that. Let, let me ask you one more question, and then I'll kind of open it up to the other uh, panelists here. Maybe, maybe they have some some questions for you as well. So, so you mentioned um, you know challenges in being a woman in you know engineering mechanics, and maybe in you know the scientific research enterprise in general. I think you're a very powerful role model now for women, given your history of success and your, you know, outstanding accomplishments. And, um, you know, I think about my own group, I think when you were, you know, with us and, and we were back at Illinois, probably you were one of the very few women in the group. I don't know exactly what the percentages were at that time, probably 10% or something like that. Maybe you, two or three others. Right, <laughs> you know, less than 10%. <laughs> well, okay, you counted. I, I knew it was a small number, but but now it's more than half, you know, uh, of the group, uh, you know, are, are women. And so I think it's a curious thing to kind of think about because I haven't made, you know, concerted effort to recruit women specifically. I'm looking mostly at merit, but I, but I think there's something to um, say about, you know, the, the power of role models. And, and um, maybe that's what's going on in my own group is that uh, other women see that women can be successful and maybe you're uh, an important part of that. And then they're attracted uh, for that reason because they see a path for them to be successful as well. And so I just wonder what your thoughts are, you know, about, you know, gender equity and, and, and thinking about how to, you know, bring more women into the scientific enterprise because, uh, you know, as you, you know, well know, they're very talented in many cases and can uh, contribute at the very highest level. So, so what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I think to myself, uh, I didn't have much awareness of this uh, gender difference or, or equity issue. Uh, back in China, we know there are a few of us, um, but we have to do uh, everything uh, as well as the uh, um, men. There, there is no special treatment or uh, uh, privilege or, or anything. Like, we just don't consider it. Like, I, I, I was just like any other female, uh, a male student to me. Um, but of course, after uh, coming to the US, uh, we, uh, are become became more aware of this gender equity issue and uh, like learning a little bit about U.S. history, like uh, equal rights uh, came uh, hard. So um, then we we realized that okay, so um, it's not just about us as individuals; it's about the group and the society. Like uh, none of us uh, us as a generation, but many generations follow. So um, because of that, I think indeed uh, role models could be uh, extremely empowering uh, to junior uh, female students. And personally, um, I had a, a lot of luck to interact with uh, people like uh, Julia Greer and uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, like uh, people on the paper, Professor Janet Bao and um, uh, Vicky Wen. So um, those uh, uh, like extraordinary, uh, the successful uh, female faculty uh, showed us that uh, we have equal uh, opportunity, uh, we have equal talents, 
uh, we have uh, uh, the only thing is the, whether we can um, have the right attitude uh, and uh, eventually can we grow that attitude to altitude. Um, so mm -hmm. that's uh, <laughs> um, uh, 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 some growth there in terms of awareness. And nowadays I'm a PI and um, I have a lot of female students in my classroom, in my group. And um, of course, uh, I feel they are like more willing to speak up and uh, interact with me um, than some of other classrooms. And um, but I I don't try to differentiate or or anything. Like mm -hmm. everyone is equal, right? Mm -hmm. Equal means no better, no worse. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to just uh, um, uh, inspire. Uh, everyone equally. Yeah, great. It's it's good to hear those those thoughts and uh, appreciate that. So, I don't want to dominate uh, the the conversation any more than I already have. I see that Jigong uh, has joined the uh, the call, so I know he had a a conflict er earlier. But as uh, your PhD advisor, maybe I'll start by giving him a chance to make a few comments, maybe ask you some questions, and then we can open it up to the broader group. I think Jimmy, we have ten minutes to go. Is that is that right? That's about right, yeah. Yeah, okay, Maybe all right, Jigong. Uh, five, six minutes or something. Okay. You're muted. You're, you're muted. Nanshu, so happy to see you here. You're just a bundle of a positive energy. Uh -huh. With John, you agree, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I need to drive somewhere soon. Uh, so, so really, uh, congratulations on your recent Awards, it, it just just a uh, yeah, Nanshu just a phenomenal. Uh, even when she was a student, she was already a leader. So I just caught uh, the last bit of you discuss inclusion. Uh, the, the, I didn't know it's, a, it's my my problem. I didn't know you actually thought about these things because <laughs> you are always a bundle of positive energy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I was just uh, so insensitive about the things. Yeah, uh, so I don't have much to say. Just uh, have a good seminar, and I will watch it uh, afterwards uh, in the on the video. And happy holidays to everyone, John. Jimmy, okay, yeah, same yeah, thing to yeah. you. Great, great to see you, Xi Gang. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Xi Gang. Does anybody else, uh, any of the other panelists, have let, let, questions? Let, let for me Nancho? follow up. Yeah, let me follow oh, go up. Ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, John, your question. Uh, I read an article uh, saying that by having more female students in the research group, the productivity actually goes up. Do you observe that phenomenon? Um, I unfortunately didn't have too many uh, female students currently. I have uh, one uh, female student in engineering mechanics, Ifan, and uh, one postdoc actually, uh, could this first PhD student, uh, Louis Z. Um, both of them are uh, very um, uh, good leaders. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, full of positive energies. <laughs> that, that is something I think really in common. And um, I think that's facilitated a lot of uh, uh, great discussions, uh, interactions, and uh, even management. Um, that's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, John, great. Jimmy, so um, we have a fantastic uh, panel here, and some of our co senior colleagues uh, uh, don't need any uh, introduction, but we do have a, a list of uh, our junior colleagues. Maybe we can go around of the uh, introduction, self-introduction, to let everyone know uh, who are on the panel. How about that? Great idea. Sure, it's a good idea. Um, do you want to start? Where, where do we want to start, Jimmy? Maybe, maybe uh, Sulin? Sure, Sulin Zhang from um, Penn State. Um, my research is about the mechanics of active materials, living, non-living, or living, non-living hybrid materials. And maybe Dae Hyung, you're a 
former colleague of uh, Nanshu and a continuing collaborator with her, I think. <laughs> you guys have known each other for a long time. <laughs> yeah, my name is Taehyung Kim uh, from Seoul National University. We, I'm, I'm working on the uh, soft electronics and uh, I have known Nanshu uh, more than 10 years and uh, she was always very happy, passionate, delightful, and she uh, actually led me and, and taught me a lot. So uh, I always have admired her and I uh, anticipate excellent talk today. Thank you. Great. Uh, KG? Sure, uh, it's KG Zhao from Purdue. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm from West Lafayette. So this is the morning time for me. Um, very happy to see you see Nancy again. Um, Although I talk to Nancho uh, frequently, but it's, uh, it's always, uh, uh, I, I learned a lot from Nancho since I was a student. And that, um, although we are at the same age, but uh, Nancho is a few years ahead of me. So <laughs> Nancho is definitely one of the role models from Gigan's group I try to learn from and uh, try to mimic. And uh, so uh, many ways, uh, Nancho has helped me uh, since I was uh, about to graduate and when I was a postdoc, tried to find a faculty job. Um, so uh, very happy to see Nancy and congratulations again. Um, unfortunately, I also need to leave uh, in a little bit. I'll watch your video and I'll, I'll be able to hear for a half hour and I'll watch your, the rest of the seminar afterwards. Thanks. Good to see you. Thanks, okay. good to see you. All right. All right, Tahir, I think everybody knows you. You're one of the senior guys, I guess, but <laughs> maybe you can <laughs> do a quick intro. <laughs> Thank you for complimenting for the age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the same group, so. <laughs> I know most of you, so from University of Illinois, uh, and I'm sure you, you are one of our products from U of, U of I and as well as Harvard. Um, every time I have listened to her talk, it's a new topic, it's a new, new idea, so I was, uh, I was always excited by her enthusiasm and energy. I, I have also a faculty meeting, a faculty search committee meeting. So I'll have to spend about half an hour and then I, I will watch the rest from the videos. Thank you. Thanks, Tahir. Yeah. Thanks, Tahir. Ying? Oh, uh, morning, everyone. So this is Ying Li from uh, University of Connecticut. So I'm mainly working on the polymer modeling, polymer mechanics, and the recent machine learning. Actually, I heard about Nanshu, uh, her famous or the great story back to Tsinghua for many years before. She always set the bar very high, so almost nobody <laughs> can go beyond. So every time I listen to her talk and uh, talk to her, so I learn something new. So this time again, the same. So look forward to your exciting uh, webinars, Nanshu, and the congratulations. Thanks, All right, Jia Lu, you probably overlapped with Nanshu when you were with uh, Charlie Lieber, yeah. I'm guessing, but uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jia Liu. I'm an assistant professor at Harvard University. Yeah, I have a, I know Nanshu for like uh, many years and uh, we are like, very good friends. And uh, and uh, I saw her as like uh, one of my like role models. And uh, and she also gave me like a tremendous help during like uh, my career. So I really I congratulate Nanshu for your like uh, awards and uh, I look forward to your like amazing uh, seminar today. Great, thanks. Chuan He, I think you guys were uh, in Jigang's group at the same time, right? Of course, of course. Uh, Nanju is a big sister uh, <laughs> for, for all, all of us, right? So uh, Nanju, uh, uh, let me just to say two things. Uh, number one, Nanju is a natural leader, wherever, wherever she is. Number two, Nanshu brings a positive energy. That's extremely important at any time. To anywhere, uh, you know, she, she join, either as a collaborator, as a PI, as a friend. Uh, so uh, look forward to your talk, Nanshu. Great, thanks, Ron Ho. So Shuju, former postdoc from my group, did not overlap with Nanshu to the best of my knowledge, but maybe you know her through other channels. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, Shuju Wang from the University of uh, Connecticut. So my research uh, focuses on soft materials and the functional structures. Uh, yeah. Uh, we I didn't have uh, our overlap with Nanshu, but yeah, as I mentioned, uh, she has been a role model for me uh, since my graduate study. I met her uh, at uh, 
uh, the 2013 SES conference back to, uh, back to Brown University. I saw that she was a graduate student when I first met her. I asked her, who did you work with? <laughs> who did you work with? Then I realized, no, <laughs> she is uh, just a rising star of faculty already. So she, yeah, indeed, she she has um, been a role model for me, for I believe for other females as well. Great. So Kev Kevin Turner, good to see you. Um, you're not quite an old guy like me and uh, Ta Hare, but you're getting there. So uh, matter. Yeah. Of <laughs> good to so, see you. Uh, we're running short on time. Great to see everyone. I'm Kevin Turner. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania in mechanical engineering and applied mechanics. Um, and uh, I love seeing Nanshu talk. I love reading Nanshu's papers, and I'm excited for today's seminar. So congratulations, Nanshu. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Yu Hong. Hey, uh, hello everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, so, um, uh, Nanshu and I uh, worked together for uh, three years in Zhigang's group. And uh, um, I think uh, uh, Nanshu was uh, the first uh, PhD student, female PhD student of Zhigang. And because uh, uh, her excellent, I think because of her excellent uh, um, work and uh, um, uh, positive energy around, that's uh, uh, maybe important reason for us to present uh, like a female, more female students in Zhigang's group. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, uh, and I also always enjoy uh, Nanshu's talk. Uh, congratulations and uh, good to see you. <laughs> Great, so we'll have to go kind of quickly here, but uh, Kun Jang, it's good to see you. You want to say a couple of words? Sure, this is uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, very nice to uh, to see you all. And uh, so this is uh, Kun Jang Yu. Uh, I'm from University of Houston. <clears throat> and it's been uh, very nice that to uh, has Nansu as a sister and a friend and always a source of uh, inspiration and advice. So I have been maintaining a very long time a relationship and a friendship with uh, uh, Nansu for, for uh, you know, probably more than 10 years now. So again, congratulations Nansu for all these achievements, awards, and looking forward to your seminar. Okay, I see that people keep joining as panelists. So this interview uh, introduction process could uh, be quite extensive. What, what do you recommend, Jim, Jimmy, should we, uh, Go quickly through the remaining folks, or, or just transition to the to the presentation, and, and maybe intros could happen uh, during the question and answer uh, session for people who didn't get a chance to say a few words. Now, uh, we have uh, four more. I okay, uh, we'll keep yeah, going. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. All right, Rubing. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone here. Uh, Rubing Bai from Northeastern University. I didn't have a uh, physical overlap with Nanshu at, back at Harvard in Jigong Source Group, but uh, we met over several places. I think we first met at ASME in Phoenix and she was also mistaken by other students as a graduate student. Uh, but mm -hmm. Nanshu has long effect. Her legacy from UIUC, um, you know, such as slides on how to apply for uh, faculty jobs. I still have those slides. I think I succeeded them from Kajie Zhao. So uh, I, I just want to let you know, Nanshu, you still have very long, big effect on us till now. Thank you. <laughs> Great. All right, Yan Fei. Hey, thank you, John. Hey, this is uh, Yan Fei Gao from uh, the infamous University of Tennessee, <laughs> like <laughs> Chikang always says. Hey, um, I have uh, the pleasure to be um, uh, the academic brother of uh, Nan Shu, and I met Nan Shu several times uh, at uh, many occasions. And uh, I invited Nan Shu to give a talk to our place that has been like uh, five or six years ago. Time flies very fast. And uh, um, I enjoyed uh, her many, many talks before and I look forward to more uh, exciting things uh, today, right? So, uh, Nice to see all of you guys here. So I see so many familiar faces. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. So Ken, you're up. Okay, hello, yeah, good to see everyone. I thought I was going to get a prize for joining this. That's the only reason I joined. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> some kind of a, a, a giveaway. But anyway, it's a pleasure to see uh, everyone here and to celebrate with Nanshu. Um, uh, a lot of you talking about your experiences with her as a graduate, former graduate students and mentors. Uh, but I can talk to you about her as a colleague uh, at the University of Texas. And um, we're very lucky to have Nanshu. She brings a lot of life, as most of you know, uh, to, to us. And for old uh, white-haired, white-bearded guys like me, uh, brings life uh, um, much more excitement than it used to be. But anyway, uh, she does a lot of things uh, full of energy and... Um, Happy to see her at UT. Okay, thank you for those comments. So last but not least, G G Yen. Hi, hi, everyone. This is Jay. So congratulations, Nansu, for the Young Men's Field Award. Uh, excellent work. So actually, I think I'm the, I may be the earliest I know Nansu because uh, when she was undergraduate student at Tsinghua, at that time I was a graduate master student so she was doing the senior design, I think, at, uh, you know, at the maybe, uh, who's, who's, who's group? I, I forgot. Uh, uh, that's the time, actually. That was the time I remember her. And then she, she went to Jigang Scoop and then, and then went to uh, John Scoop. I, I follow up with uh, his work in her work. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's a wonderful work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Jimmy, do we want to transition straight into the uh, seminar, or do you want to present the uh, slides on the EML webinar series? Uh, huh. Good question. We're running a little late, right? Uh, let, yeah, let I think we should just, just go. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, maybe just quickly go through okay. the... Uh, You see the slides? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go through the team EML this time. Uh, we probably all know who we are. And I just want to highlight uh, for EML webinars, we also publish overviews. So uh, I'm highlighting four of them. The overview by Hua Jian Gao and his group, overview by Oli Sigma, uh, overview by uh, Xi Chao Feng and overview by Tang Li. It just happened that these four overviews uh, were written by a researcher in Singapore, in Denmark, in China at Tsinghua University and uh, in the United States at University of Maryland. So it's truly an international group. Uh, we started this last year 2020 in the midst of uh, the pandemic. And it was very successful. We continued for season two. And now season two, we have nine speakers. And this is the season finale by Nanshu. Okay. Uh, we also uh, did uh, some social experiments. Uh, we, we started the GoFundMe site. And uh, we set a target of 3,000. We raised $3,111. Thank you for, thank all of, all of you who contributed to this. And uh, it's not the money dollar amount, it's the attitude, it's the enthusiasm that we really truly, truly appreciate. Okay, with that, Zhang, back to you. Okay, great. Uh, Ji Gang, would you like to uh, introduce Nanshu, or would you like me to do that? Please do that. Okay, all right. Well, it gives me great pleasure then to formally introduce Nanshu as the EML webinar speaker today. So just looking at her bio, she's extremely accomplished at every different level imaginable. She's currently the Temple Foundation Endowed Associate Professor uh, at UT Austin, where I did my undergraduate degree. They have fa fantastic department there, beautiful new facilities. I just visited there in uh, October to give a seminar and had a chance to meet with Nanshu and see her labs and, and her group. It's amazing. Uh, she did her uh, bachelor's degree at Tsinghua University, PhD from Harvard with Gang, as we were discussing. She was with me as a Beckman postdoctoral fellow 
at UIUC, uh, where she really launched a lot of our work in uh, skin interfaced uh, electronics and bringing really deep mechanics related insights to those uh, platforms. And so she runs a really vibrant, diverse research program of her own at this point that uh, combines mechanics and materials, manufacturing, human robot integration, soft electronics. She's been named one of uh, the top 35 in innovators under 35 by MIT Technology Review. Uh, she's won all of the awards you can imagine, NSF Career Award, AFOSR Young Investigator Award, 3M Non-Tenured Faculty Award. But most recently, she was named the uh, Thomas Hughes Young Investigator uh, from the ASME Applied Mechanics Division. And so congratulations um, for, for that, Nanshu, very, very well uh, deserved. Uh, and she's a very highly uh, published and highly cited researcher. And so, so she'll uh, share with us today some of the re uh, most recent research uh, from her group. Uh, the title of her talk is Soft Electronics for Digitizing Human Body and Human-Centered Robotics. So it's all yours, Nanshun. Thank you so much, John. And uh, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, spending a moment with me here. Uh, your presence really uh, means a lot to me. Um, so let me get started here. Um, hello to uh, colleagues, friends, students, postdocs all over the world. Uh, it is my great pleasure to give the uh, season two um, last EML webinar attended and surrounded by many um, friends and um, um, mentors and students. So um, I'm going to share with you um, essentially a human-centered soft electronics. Um, currently, I am speaking to you from Austin, Texas. Uh, it is kind of hot in both in terms of both weather and um, the uh, atmosphere here. Uh, Austin is the capital of Texas. Uh, it has a nickname to be Silicon Hills. Uh, it's the hometown of Dell, National Instruments, NXT Semiconductors, Indeed, and so on. And uh, many companies are um, moving their headquarters to Austin, Oracle, Tesla, and the list is growing. Uh, it is the live music capital of the world. We have a lot of live music and bars and young people, and uh, it's a uh, named as the best place to live uh, for uh, many, many times. Uh, UT Austin is uh, my um, current institute. It is the flagship of U of Texas series. It's very big. We have more than 50,000 uh, students, and uh, in total, we have more than 70 population. Uh, it, it's very rich. Uh, UT Austin alone has four billion endowment, and UT System has more than thirty billion. And it's ranked forty-three best global universities by U.S. News. It's the number twelve best engineering schools in the U.S. And also, very importantly, it's the alma mater of Professor John Rogers. Um, John mentioned about my lab. So if you want to get a quick virtual tour, uh, feel free to scan this QR code. So the uh, research uh, of our group is uh, really uh, rooted to this uh, industry 4.0. So if you look back into human uh, society history, uh, we have already finished three industrial revolutions. Uh, each of them has profoundly changed our lifestyles, our productivity, and our ways of thinking. So currently, we are going through the fourth one right now. It is uh, called Industry 4.0. It is uh, named as the cyber physical systems, which include things like Internet of Things, robotics, automation, um, big data, human-machine interaction, um, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and so on. So the key is uh, how to link the cyber physical world together. But I don't want us to leave uh, human out of this picture because uh, there is a risk that we become irrelevant. So 
personally, I would like to call it cyber physical file system. Uh, why do I say we have a risk? Um, it's actually promoted by Elon Musk. Uh, he said that humans must merge with machines or become irrelevant in AI age. If you can't beat the machines, it's better to become one. So um, there is an emerging vision that in the future, uh, humans not only have to interact with machines, humans need to merge with machines or robots. And if you uh, carefully look into this kind of a uh, human machine interface, um, we realize that our human body is intrinsically soft, continuous, and an analog, whereas uh, uh, conventional machines or robots are rigid, discrete, and digital. Um, the question is, how can we really bridge this huge gap in between? And in the future, is it possible for humans to be more like robots and robots to be more like humans? So the first task we could uh, envision is to uh, digitize human body because all the machine world is uh, digital and electronic. So human body is continuously radiating um, highly distributed multimodal personal data about our health, our readiness, our intention, and emotion. We say it's distributed because from head to toe, we have uh, very different signals. If you want to measure the brain, it has to be from the brain. If you want to measure the muscle, it has to be on the muscle. It's multimodal, we have electrical, signal, which are biopotentials or electrophysiological signals. We have mechanical motion, blood pressure, and a step pressure. We have a thermal signal. We even have a lot of biochemical markers. And it's personal, of course. Everybody is radiating different data. It's continuous. So ideally, uh, we want to build something called a digital twin in the cyberspace of our human body. Um, and then this uh, uh, digital avatar is able to interact with machines, connect to the internet, and uh, contribute to the big data. So digital twin is actually a concept that first proposed by NASA in 2010 um, for the uh, numerical models of uh, spacecraft. But nowadays, it becomes increasingly popular because of things like uh, um, metaverse. It's basically a virtual representation or a, an avatar that serves as the real-time digital counterpart of a physical object or process. It has the following features. It has to mimic the structure, the context, and the behavior of the physical asset. It should be dynamically updated with physical data, and ultimately it should inform decisions that real life value. So as we can see, um, it, if we can build a digital twin for human body or even for human organ, then uh, it will have a significant impact for things like disease management, performance tracking, uh, metaverse, and so on. So here we uh, realize how important the uh, physical data is and to acquire uh, high fidelity physical data from the human body, uh, we need a soft electronics, bio-integrated, bio-conformable electronics. So this poor guy is really armed to the teeth. Um, we are um, consolidating a lot of your work uh, here today um, onto this uh, uh, poor guy. Uh, we have Dehyun's artificial retina, John's um, uh, optogenetic uh, brain patch, our um, wireless uh, chest eater too, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, shear phones, uh, twining uh, nerve electrodes, um, Stephanie's Edura, and uh, Professor Zhongli Wang, and many others, uh, energy harvesters, and so on, right? So it's a really booming uh, field to work and uh, contribute. But there are many challenges um, to re realize uh, those kind of uh, mechanically robust and uh, functionally superior um, soft bioelectronics. 
So um, my two engineering mechanics students, uh, C and Ethan, uh, they spend a lot of time to summarize those kind of uh, wide ranges of length scales, Young's moduli, and the strain levels associated with the uh, bioelectronics. So if we look at the characteristic length scales, um, like the aorta is very smooth and skin uh, has some roughness, uh, tens of microns, and then uh, eyeballs are here, uh, heart are here. So widespread uh, orders of magnitude in terms of uh, characteristic length. And also um, in terms of stiffness, Young's moduli, um, we have uh, biomaterials in the bottom and man-made materials on the top. And we can see brains could be even softer than kilopascal and all the way up to bones and enamel. And in terms of uh, man-made materials, especially uh, electronic materials, we have uh, silicon metal here, uh, hundreds of gigapascal, graphene, even terapascal. We also have a lot of polymers. Uh, they are more comparable with bile tissues. And uh, there is uh, still a huge gap because uh, inorganic uh, electronics are still um, way stiffer. In terms of a uh, strain range, so even uh, our brain uh, wobbles as uh, we, our heartbeat, we walk or have impact, a few percent of strain, uh, our heart up to 20%. And all the way to uh, knee and shoulder, 50%. Facial expression, quite large strain, all the way to elbow and other joints. So um, our uh, future soft electronics have to accommodate this kind of uh, extremely large range of uh, strength on our body. So to overcome a lot of those challenges, as you can see, um, we want to uh, really um, use fundamental science to build uh, ultimately soft bioelectronic systems uh, to really achieve our vision that one day human and a robot will become uh, seamless. So that is our vision and um, that is why even though I am a mechanician, I still want to work on electronics and materials. But uh, we still uh, start from fundamental mechanics of flexible and stretchable structures. And after we have a good design with the mechanistic guidance, uh, we look into how to build them on digital manufacture and also how to transfer them onto human body. And um, sometimes <clears throat> conventional materials are not enough we have to look into nano and 2D materials to achieve uh, some very specific uh, goals and functionalities. But even after you have a beautiful design, you have a very good manufacturing process and you are using uh, the most uh, emerging materials, uh, you still have to worry about the uh, interface between um, bio tissues and electronics because this interface dictates the uh, um, performance. Um, and uh, we have uh, also tried uh, to engineer um, some physical or dry adhesives, but I will not be able to talk a lot about them today. So um, this uh, uh, four research threats eventually uh, bring us to those kind of uh, system level integration and uh, human subject validation and uh, uh, clinical validation. So uh, first is about um, stretchability, right? We know that stiff materials are not intrinsically stretchable, but if we mm, structure them properly, like a 3D spring or a 2D serpentine ribbon, uh, we are able to make any material stretchable using this kind of serpentine structure. And uh, the trick is that even though we have large end-to-end -end displacement, that displacement can be accommodated by a uh, rigid body rotation as well as out of plane buckling. This was first proposed um, by Turner and Zhigong, and uh, now we have a series of uh, uh, theories and experiments to uh, really give you analytical solutions and provide a practical guidance. So uh, using serpentine ribbons, um, first thing we have to 
think about is uh, how uh, soft it can be. So uh, we adopt this very popular so-called horseshoe serpentine design, and we have an arc, which is just a, a part of a circle and a linear arm and joined by another arc, and this can repeat. So um, if we have this kind of horseshoe uh, structure, we can uh, analytically using uh, either curved beam theory or elasticity to predict the stiffness of a serpentine structure normalized by its uh, straight counterpart. Uh, we can see that alpha is this joining angle when it's negative 90 degree, it is a, a linear ribbon, a straight ribbon. So it starts from one, and when it becomes larger, zero is half circle, and larger is uh, more than half circle. So we can have orders of magnitude reduction in terms of stiffness. That gives us hope to build a skin soft electronics out of intrinsically very rigid and stiff organ inorganic uh, metals and silicon. In terms of stretchability, we always care about where is the maximum strain and how big is it, because a lot of brittle materials like silica rupture at about 1% strain. So we developed curved beam theory and elasticity uh, to analytically solve the strain fields inside the serpentine under stretching uh, horizontally. So here are the strain fields plotted on undeformed shape. Um, and we can see maximum strain in serpentine always occur at the inner crest. And uh, we're plotting the ratio between the um, horizontal strain and the applied strain. So if this ratio is smaller than one, it indicates strain reduction mechanism in the serpentine. But sometimes it's not always smaller than one, as I will show you. When the serpentine is stacked or when the serpentine is close to straight shape, it's actually a strain concentration site, and it will make serpentine uh, even more easier to break. So uh, with our analytical solution and numerical solution, we can uh, see that um, it's all monotonic, um, except for the uh, joining angle effect. When we have narrower serpentine, we will have longer arms, um, when we have more tortuosity or more waviness, we always have smaller ratio of the strain, and that means that we have a significant strain reduction. Mm, but you can see that when alpha is close to negative 90 degree, which means it's close to a straight ribbon, um, we have somewhere that is even larger than one, this ratio, and that indicates um, that serpentines are not always more stretchable than their straight counterparts. We have to be very careful with this kind of uh, abnormality. Those are all freestanding serpentines. When it's supported by substrate, substrate could play a significant uh, role. When it's a soft substrate, it's the ITO, which is a transparent conductor, indium tin oxide, very brittle. And uh, we can see straight ITO rupture at 1% as a brittle material, but when we pattern them into serpentine shape, uh, they can be stretched more than 100% because the soft substrate does not really constrain the rigid body rotation and even auto plane buckling of the serpentine ribbon. But when we have a stiff substrate like tapon or PET, um, they fully constrain those kind of uh, strain releasing mechanism. And no matter how we tune the uh, width or shape of the serpentine, the rupture strain is always close to 1%. It means serpentine basically has no use on steep substrates. And uh, this is uh, also uh, something we see in industry. And uh, um, we want to, again, uh, show a warning here. So based on those uh, um, fundamental mechanics uh, knowledge, in um, serpentine, we could uh, build a lot of uh, skin soft uh, electronics. And uh, this is the, uh, the beginning of that. Um, when I was a postdoc in John's group working with uh, Dae Hyun, and um, we are able to use the so called filamentary serpentine network of serpentines. And we are building uh, literally a uh, hair thing, uh, skin soft. Um, epidermal electronics or electronic tattoo stickers 
that can be patched on any part of the skin, for example, around human neck. Uh, I believe this was Dehan, uh, speaking different words, up, down, left, right. And then uh, he can play a school band game just uh, from his uh, neck muscle vibration instead of his uh, voice. At that time, uh, Dehan taught me all this microfabrication process. Um, uh, he was my hero. He is uh, having 100% yield, but I only had like 20% yield. It is a very difficult process if you uh, look at it. Uh, back in the clean room, Ganda doing a lot of uh, photolithography, wet etching, dry etching, um, using rigid wafers. It's uh, really time consuming, and if any step fails, we have to start over. Fortunately, John is very rich, and we don't have to care about all the cost, but it is actually very expensive. So uh, at UT, uh, we started to think about um, whether we could do freeform or digital manufacturing of the ETA tooth, um, which means we don't have to use any photo mask or stencil or template. Of course, uh, we are all aware of additive manufacture or printed electronics, but uh, there are some limitations such as uh, taking time for ink to dry or anneal. And even after ink annealing, uh, their resistivity are still higher than pure metal. And that would give us the lossy antenna. And um, silver or copper inks are very popular, but uh, over time they can get oxidized or react with sweat. Uh, gold inks are available, but they are very expensive. So um, if uh, we look into subtractive manufacturing, which is also digital, but instead of adding material, we remove material, uh, we are able to process uh, already sheet-like raw materials uh, directly purchased from the uh, market, such as copper foil, gold foil, uh, CVD grown large area graphene, um, piezoelectric PVDF uh, polymer sheets, and, and so on. Subtractive uh, using a mechanical or laser cutter could be chemical free and completely dry process. And uh, currently, uh, laser patterning is widely used for rapid prototyping of PCB already in industry. So uh, we started with a $300 desktop uh, mechanical cutter plotter. It was designed, designed to um, cut paper or vinyl signs. There is a limitation of the resolution. Um, at that time, we first cut it just the aluminum foils, but uh, all of us worked with aluminum foil know it's very brittle. Why? Aluminum is a very ductile material. Why is aluminum foil brittle? Uh, it uh, ties back to my PhD work with Jigang and used black back, uh, which where we know that for metal zinc films, although locally we can have large plastic deformation, which is called necking and string localization, globally the uh, strain is still very small when it ruptures at uh, the neck. However, if we can support it by a relatively stiff and a thick polymer substrate, uh, the polymer substrate is able to distribute the plastic deformation very uniformly inside the metal film and it will not show any crack until more than 50%. This is a straight ribbon, no serpentine. And Tern uh, first proposed this mechanism and I experimentally validated that. And fortunately on the market there are a lot of metalized polymers where you can purchase and a customized uh, way custom customly ordered a uh, 100 nanometer thick gold thin film on 13 micron thick PET. We put it on a thermal release tape, and then we literally did a so-called cut and paste process. Put it into the mechanical cutter plotter, it will carve the seams as you designed, and then you just deactivate the thermal release tape, and you can peel off the extraneous part, and you can paste the leftover desirable patterns onto uh, target substrates like commercial tattoo paper or medical tape or human skin. The whole process takes you 10 minutes. It's completely free form, dry. It could be large area, multi-material. You can uh, cut and paste the multiple materials onto the same tattoo. And later I'll show you it's tolerable. So uh, this was a cut and pasted uh, e-tattoo transferred on human skin with a little bit of spray-on adhesive. 
So there is some adhesion and we don't need any tape to cover it. So it's basically a very breathable and uh, um, sweat tolerant uh, e tattoo. And uh, only using gold, which is touching the uh, skin on the backside, will have uh, some uh, titanium, that's the color of the tie. So uh, we can measure things like ECG out of the pair of electrodes, uh, skin hydration using the dot ring uh, electrodes, and a very long resistor from here all the way to here, that's a resistive temperature detector. So when we heat up the subject, uh, the uh, uh, skin temperature started to rise after 10 minutes, skin start to sweat. After another 10 minutes, the surface of the skin is full of sweat. As you can see, the skin hydration saturated. Even though it was full of sweat, we can still measure pretty high fidelity uh, ECG here. This is a blown up view and extract heart rate. So it's uh, actually a uh, very sweat tolerable. And uh, in addition to uh, electrical signals on the chest, there is also a very subtle mechanical signal. If you put your fingers on the chest, you can feel your heartbeat. Uh, that is called a seismocardiogram. Um, to really quantify how big it is, uh, we actually collaborated with a colleague at UT to do 3D full field digital image correlation. And this is a, the uh, after filtering the breathing pattern, we can see just the, the SDG, the out of um, plane displacement is up to eight micron, quite small. And uh, we can see the distribution. And we also see that uh, for individual uh, heartbeat, we actually have two uh, peaks, peak one, sound one, and sound two. And um, the peaks are very location dependent. So uh, when you put your sensor here, you only measure the second peak very well, not the first one. On the bottom, only the first one, not the second one. But in the middle, you measure both of them reasonably well. So that's the um, contribution of the 3D DIC. So we uh, subsequently built a dual mode ECG plus SCG tattoo and put it at the uh, middle location to the left of the sternum. So on the CETA2, it's just a two cut and paste process, first for a pair of gold electrodes for ECG, and then another cut and paste for a commercially available uh, piezoelectric polymer sheet, PVDF, also patterned into a filamentary serpentine network. And that is a basically a vibration sensor, but uh, compared with the inertia measurement units, uh, those are soft and ultra thin and have good mechanical impedance matching with uh, human chest. So here are real signals of ECG and SCG synchronously measured. Um, on ECG, we have very familiar QRS peaks. On SCG, actually, uh, the peaks indicate heart valve opening and closing, mitral valve closing, aortic valve opening. And when you have synchronous measurement, uh, you are able to extract a lot of very important cardiac time intervals, such as the pre-ejection period, the uh, left ventricular ejection time, from the R peak of ECG to AC peak of SCG, it's the systole or the RAC interval. Uh, they have different views. And uh, uh, for example, the systole or the RAC interval has a negative correlation with the blood pressure. Um, the, we can calibrate for each individual and then after we have the calibration curve, because the tattoo is measuring uh, ECG and SCG simultaneously heart uh, beat by beat, we can always get the uh, RAC interval for every heartbeat, look up into this calibration curve, we can extract one's blood pressure beat by beat. And that gives us a way to continuously estimate blood pressure and it uh, can capture very abrupt blood pressure change and it also works well uh, during night without waking up the patient. Uh, however, at that time, you can see we used a lot of cables to connect to the data acquisition board. So a very um, capable and mature ECE PhD student, uh, Pyo Yang, who is now a postdoc with Zhang and who is now uh, job hunting for a faculty job, uh, he actually uh, invented this uh, cut solder paste method to integrate uh, IC chips off the shelf, such as the um, analog front end 
microprocessor, uh, Bluetooth, near field communication chips onto the ETA2. So it's still cutting and pasting, but the caveat is we need a, a temporary support to solder. So he actually came up with the idea that we have to use a water soluble tape supported by Capton. Capton has very high thermal budget. Water soluble tape enables the releasing at the end. So uh, using this cut solder paste process, we can build a multi-layer wireless ETA2 uh, with a very modular design. So on the bottom, we have disposable electro layer because it, it directly touched the skin. And we want to just uh, uh, make it one-time use. And in the middle, we have readout circuit depending on the functionality. It could be uh, ECG analog front end or hydration or SPO2. And uh, we have the top uh, near field communication layer. So it's very modular, meaning that no matter what you want to sense, the NFC layer is the same. It's just uh, for data transmission and wireless charging. But the readout circuit has to be changed depending on your application. And uh, the electrode layer also has to be tailored. This is how they look like after stacking them up. And this is a, um, a multi-layer ETA2 that has uh, rigid components. But because of the soldering, as well as the serpentine sedimentary design, uh, it is still bendable, stretchable, twistable, and uh, waterproof. Uh, we can wirelessly charge while wirelessly read from the ETA2. And uh, that doesn't require any uh, active battery on the ETA2. But if we want to integrate a battery, currently we're still actually lacking flexible and uh, stretchable batteries. So um, uh, at that time, uh, we have to uh, build this multi-layer. And uh, the good news is that we are able to disassemble those layers after use. And then we can recycle and reuse uh, those uh, active electronic layers and just dispose the passive electron layers. And so we also call it reconfigurable wireless ETA2. But it still is a manual uh, fabrication process. So currently, I have two very talented ECE PhD students, Chernab and Philip. Uh, they are uh, inventing this kind of uh, FPC-based uh, dual-mode wireless chest ETA2 using Bluetooth. And that requires a uh, battery. So uh, because of the serpentine design in the FPC, which can be industrially made, then uh, it could also become a stretchable ETA2. And uh, we have to work with the synchronization and the peak detection in real time to extract the cardiac time intervals. And uh, as I mentioned, they can be used for blood pressure. They can also be used for cardiac output and uh, even uh, for other atrial fibrillation and other um, cardiovascular disease detection. So um, as we build more and more functionality into the ETA2, the ETA2, uh, as you can see, is become uh, thicker and a multi-layer. But uh, uh, if we ask ourselves, what is the true uh, fundamental difference between ETA2 and conventional rigid wearables, it is actually uh, the thickness and the softness of the ETA2. Uh, under micro scale, it is very obvious that only ultra thin and ultra soft layers are able to well conform to human skin. This was uh, Professor Rogers' work. And um, uh, this kind of uh, uh, full conformability would uh, give us much better contact uh, between the electronics and the human skin which would uh, lower the interface impedance and which would give us higher signal-to-noise ratio. And when the skin deforms, uh, there is uh, no slippage between the two. There's no relative motion, which could lower the motion artifact and could also give us more accurate measurement of the real skin deformation because there's no more slippage. And if you care about the thermal or mass transfer across the interface, of course, this is much better than a rigid board sitting on rough skin. So Professor Rogers um, and Professor Yong Dan Huang's experimental and theoretical work um, inspired us to build an analytical model 
to uh, predict how thin and how soft the patch has to be to achieve this 100% conformability. So assuming Ecoflex on skin, they have similar modulus and the skin roughness is given. Assuming no added adhesion, just better worse adhesion. Um, for, uh, actually, my previous PhD student, Liu Wang, um, built a beautiful analytical model to predict that the Ecoflex has to be less than seven micron to achieve 100% full conformability. And beyond this, that critical value, there's actually an instability to lose conformability all the way from 100% to 24%. There's nothing in between. And this was the um, uh, independently modeled without any fitting parameter, but we can see very uh, good agreement between experiment and model. So five micron, fully conformable, 36 micron, barely conformable, 100 micron, forget about it. So, so um, Leo did a, a lot of analytical work at the UT and now is a postdoc with Shen He at MIT, and uh, he is about to join USTC very soon. So um, that promoted us to think, okay, um, what is the thinnest material that we can use to build ETA2 so that they can achieve uh, this 100% conformability? That uh, is uh, uh, giving us motivation to look into 2D materials, which are the world's thinnest materials. They are, uh, it's a family of 2D materials, electronically very uh, functional, and the automatic thing, optically transparent, some of them, uh, they are mechanically robust, meaning that they are cuttable. For example, uh, we uh, cut and pasted metal and polymer sheets, but we never cut and pasted silicon or ITO. So, but 2D materials are cuttable because of their mechanical property and uh, chemically inert and uh, potentially low cost. But 2D materials, uh, although they are very thin, they are not very stretchable. Um, they are more stretchable materials and devices, but they are a little bit thicker. So we start to engineer uh, graphene ETA2, uh, which is both thin and soft. And the Professor Takao Somia engineered the golden nanomesh, which is even thinner. So when we first played with uh, 2D materials, we did everybody else did to just exfoliate um, crystals on silicon wafer because that's the uh, cheapest way. But um, we were very frustrated by a lot of defects, as you can see here, bubbles, uh, tents, um, uh, wrinkles, you see, uh, those are um, not usable for device building. But uh, fortunately, we had a, a two very um, talented and um, uh, deep uh, thinkers. Uh, Zhao He and uh, Danny. Zhao He is a theoretician in mechanics. Danny is a material scientist uh, student. Um, they formed a dream team. They said not to toss away those kind of uh, wafers. Let's examine uh, the profiles of the bubbles and tents and see if we can build mechanistic understanding for those uh, nano bubbles and nano tents um, as uh, uh, a mechanics investigation. So from there, uh, they actually um, built a, a beautiful framework to look into the strain, the interface, the force deflection relationship, and even the instability of those buckle, uh, bubbles and tents and published a series of papers, um, very fundamental and very deep in uh, mechanics and very useful information. But today, I will skip all those beautiful work and uh, I will uh, bring us back to track on um, graphing ETA2. So the conclusion was basically it's beautiful for mechanics study, but it's um, not useful for device building. So we later went from exfoliated 2D materials to um, CVD grown 2D materials. And we again used our cut and paste fabrication, but before the cutting, we have to do this very conventional web transfer process for graphene. And after fishing this uh, PMA supported graphene, um, we uh, do not remove PMA and we keep the graphene facing up. From here on, there's no more web process, no more photo lethal or developer to contaminate the graphene surface. Very clean, very pristine graphene surface. After cutting and pasting the 
clean graphene is directly touching the skin. And he, uh, this work was uh, led by a previous postdoc Shide in collaboration with Professor Deji Akiwondik. So here we can um, show you a video uh, to transfer the graphene e tattoo out of uh, tattoo paper onto human skin. By smearing water, uh, we can remove the tattoo backing paper and leaving the graphene e tattoo on the skin. Uh, there is no added adhesive, it's just a bivalent wall force, but because PMA is long is 500 nanometers, so uh, it is an ultra thin, ultra conformable E tattoo, and uh, it's also optically quite transparent and invisible. So uh, this is how transparent it is. Um, the uh, transmittance is more than 85%. This is a thickness dominated by PMA because 2D uh, atomically thin graphene, monolayer graphene was only 0.34 nanometer. If we use a straight ribbon, uh, it would uh, rupture at 20%. It actually started rupture at about uh, uh, 2%, but it doesn't fully rupture at 20%. If we pattern into a serpentine shape, it doesn't fully rupture until 50%. A very uh, key a feature of uh, ultra thin and ultra conformable graphene ETA2 is this uh, um, uh, electrode skin interface impedance as low as the wet gel electrodes. So it can give us uh, also high signal to noise ratio of physiological signals as well as the gel electrodes. So because it's so invisible and so thin, we put it around the human eyes on human face but uh, no one can really uh, tell that you are wearing a tattoo on your face. And around human eyes, we can measure the eyeball rotation induced the surface bio potential, which is called the electro-oculogram. Uh, we use uh, a open BCI Bluetooth uh, data acquisition board, and it can broadcast it to this laptop. This laptop process and interpret the EOG signal and convert that to control a drone. So the drone is flying according to uh, Hyoyang's eyesight. If he looks left, the drone flies left. And there's no camera whatsoever on the drone, so it is all coming from his eyeball uh, rotation induced surface potential. So at that time, uh, we didn't show what we didn't show you is that this kind of interconnect between graphene eta two and the rigid board is the most troublesome. The graphene tattoo is quite robust, but if he uh, even moves his head uh, a little bit too much after this installation, this interface uh, fails and uh, the whole uh, project fails. So mm, it is because uh, there is a huge business mismatch between ultra thin on graphene e tattoo or other ultra thin e tattoos and conventional uh, printed circuit board. The thickness mismatch is more than 10,000 times. The stiffness mismatch is more than 200,000 times. So what kind of interconnection could reliably interface graphene with rigid board? Um, that is a problem puzzling a lot of people, not just us, from packaging and integration, from the system level stretchability and interface. So I'm not going to read over those frustrations, but basically everyone is saying, oh, the interconnect between uh, ultra thin devices and rigid circuits is a challenge. Uh, and uh, uh, most of us focus on the sensor, but not the interconnect, but the more work is required for the interconnect. So we say, okay, we are a mechanician. Uh, we should take a close look at this. And uh, fortunately, a very uh, smart material science a student in our group, Hong Wu, uh, came up with this uh, idea, which now we call heterogeneous uh, serpentine ribbon. Hong Wu was actually a postdoc in, uh, actually, sorry, an undergrad in John's group and joined our group as a PhD student. So uh, his idea is this, okay, uh, if uh, serpentine is so stretchable, um, can we use a serpentine interface between graphene and the gold, for example? So uh, it's basically a, a pure mechanical lamination 
between graphene serpentine and the gold serpentine. Graphene is facing down, gold is facing up. Graphene is touching the skin, so it has to face down, and the gold has to face up to contact with the graphene. So this kind of a serpentine contact is called a heterogeneous serpentine ribbon. Of course, the gold uh, cannot be too thick, otherwise the step edge would be too high. We're still studying how high is uh, uh, not going to work. But uh, without any adhesion, graphene can well conform to gold and it does not sleep on gold. The gold has roughness. So this is the interface here. And uh, to interface with a rigid board, uh, Hong Wu proposed the idea of using a soft interlayer that has vertical electrical conductivity using those uh, carbon uh, or nickel doped uh, silicone rubber. So the soft layer is like a cushion, a strain isolation layer between the rigid board and the gold. The gold is very thin, remember? So um, we performed a lot of experiments and a numerical simulation to illustrate this uh, heteroserpentine ribbon idea. Oh, this is how the uh, physical uh, device look like. So we are putting it on the palm because we're trying to measure something called the electrodermal activity. Our palm is full of echoing sweat glands, which are controlled by sympathetic nerves that react with mental stresses and the emotional arousal. And only palm and feet have those echoing sweat glands. So when we are nervous, uh, actually right now, I have some sweat on my palm. And um, to measure that, palm is the best location. And commercially, um, we have to use a gel electrodes connected to the palm like this onto a wristwatch. So this is how the uh, hetero serpentine connected to the wristwatch with this soft interlayer. So uh, we compared the uh, stretchability of uh, four different uh, examples. One is the hetero straight ribbon, uh, where we have a, a step edge. Those are all straight overlap. Another one is just a pure straight get. And um, the third one is a hetero serpentine ribbon with the um, gold edge, step edge terminating at the crest of the serpentine. Intuitively, we know it's not very good because the maximum strain occurs at the crest, if you remember. And lastly, we have the step edge terminating at the arm. And we expect this one to be more stretchable. So here are the experimental results. We measure the end-to-end -end electrical resistance as a function of applied strain horizontally. So the first one is the least stretchable, as we all could appreciate. The step edge is a big trouble. Um, the um, straight get doesn't rupture until about 10%, as we previously mentioned. So those two have been also uh, summarized in another paper. And we studied also the microfracture of the get. But the heteroserpentine ones are more stretchable. The crest one uh, is up to about 35%. The um, arm one is uh, more than 50% stretchable. Eventually, the arm one actually ruptured at the crest instead of the arm, um, because the here has actually even more larger strain than the arm. So using uh, R over R naught two as the criteria, uh, we can extract the stretchability and plot them here. And even after 10,000 cycles, uh, up, up to 20%, um, this kind of a heteroserpentine interface is very reliable. In terms of uh, mechanical modeling, um, we can see that uh, if it's a, a hetero straight ribbon, the step edge gives us a, a lot of strain concentration. The applied strain is only 20%, the edge has 35%. It's, that's why it's not stretchable. But when we have the hetero serpentine ribbon, at the crest, we have 6.7%. At the arm, even with the step edge like this, uh, we only have 0.7% strain. Actually, the maximum strain still occurred at the crest of the get. That's why it's ruptured here, not here. <clears throat> so if we plot the maximum strength compared with the hetero straight ribbon, the hetero serpentine ribbon at the arm can give us a 50-fold of strain reduction. 
So um, this is a very practical solution to the uh, interconnect between ultra thin ETA2 and any kind of rigid uh, circuit. So because of the robustness, we are able to measure um, ambulatory electrodermal activity using graphene ETA2. The blue ones are the gas data, the red ones are the gel data. We can see the gel detached very often and we have to replace them multiple times during this uh, 15 hour measurement. But the gas stayed very robust and well connected to the gold. Eventually, actually, the gold the PI ruptured. Remember, it was not very thick. So there are ways can, that can improve the uh, robustness, but get and the uh, hetero interconnect remained very uh, intact. So um, as a summary, uh, this is our effort uh, to digitize human body. Uh, we have to use highly multimodal ETA tools uh, and we have to put them at the right location to measure the right thing. But uh, while human is trying to be more digital, um, robots are trying to be more mimicking human. So um, this is a new area my uh, group is trying to uh, enter. So previously we focused on ETA tools, which is for digitizing human body. Uh, now we uh, are also looking at e schemes which is for human mimicking robots. E-skins are for robots to wear. And e-skin is a very um, uh, big and uh, active field. Um, there are a lot of pioneers uh, working in this field and we're just uh, newcomers. So if we look into uh, pressure sensing mechanisms, we chose piezo capacitive because of their high sensitivity, their consistency, little drifting, and a little temperature dependence, and so on. If you look at conventional parallel plate capacitor, uh, we know that it has a nonlinear relationship with uh, applied pressure. Uh, at a small strain, this slope can be uh, analytically derived, uh, which has this kind of uh, uh, equation uh, that can uh, give us a hint to enhance sensitivity. You can reduce the Young's modulus, or you can make the dielectric effective dielectric constant of this the middle layer to increase with the applied pressure. Indeed, uh, the field has implemented those two ideas very well, and there are numerous of uh, beautiful examples using surface patterning or porous material to reduce the modulus, and using high K polymer with pores to improve the decay DP. So there are a lot of work already. If you put them into an Ashby chart where um, the sensitivity is plotted versus the pressure range, we can see that indeed we can achieve very high sensitivity at but very small pressure, and then the lower sensitivity at high pressure. And after a lot of efforts, um, we kind of reached the limit of this uh, boundary here. So the question is, can we use the, uh, a little bit new mechanism to cover or to expand into this challenging area? So if you look at this the conventional piezo capacitive pressure sensor, it is only benefiting from the capacitance change during compression. Um, a very talented and a capable uh, PhD student in my group, Kyung Ho, now applying for postdoc, has proposed this brilliant idea that how about we also leverage piezo resistivity, which was a popular mechanism, but previously they were independently pursued. So his idea was, can we use a barely electrically conductive porous um, uh, nanocomposite, uh, which is barely conductive, and when it's compressed, there is both resistance change and the capacitance change. So th there is hybrid response. But to make the whole device still capacitive, we can add an ultra thin insulator, which compared with the porous composite, is uh, not really uh, deformable, much stiffer. So his hypothesis is we could increase the capacitive pressure sensor sensitivity over large pressure range by the hybrid response pressure sensor. And he went ahead and he made 
this kind of porous nanocomposite. And I'm going to skip a lot of details, but it's very flexible, very bendable, and it's highly porous with carbon nanotube doped ecoflex um, deep coating uh, deep coating the nickel foam and etching the nickel foam away. We end up with open cellular tubular structure. So he compared the herb behavior with the four counterparts. The first is the, um, the red and pink ones are the solid ones. The solid dielectric doesn't give good sensitivity. That's what we all know. The green ones are the porous ones. They give reasonably good sensitivity. But none of them are comparable with herbs because herbs leverage both resistance change and capacitance change. Um, if you plot the sensitivity versus pressure, we clearly see this two stage of enhancement, first due to porosity and then due to the piezo resistivity. And now using herbs, we can push the envelope uh, up by sometimes more than 400%. But the caveat is how much doping we should use in the herbs. Because if it's too much doping, it becomes a piezo, it's a resistor, basically. If it's not conductive enough, it's a capacitor. So there is a sweet spot in between, and we build an analytical model, a simplified model using the simplified circuit. The solid curves are the theory, the dotted lines are the experiment. And we can see when the, there is a, a sweet spot, about 0.5%, and we can predict that. When the theory is, when the doping is too much, uh, we can see that the uh, assumption broke down that we have parallel plate and uh, a parallel electrical field. So the disagreement enlarges. Because of the sensitivity, we can put them around any kind of human pulses to measure the pulse wave. Even under a lot of uh, uh, preload, like when we wear the headset, uh, the preload uh, compromised the sensitivity a little bit, but still able to give us a very uh, good signal even at the temporal artery. And now, Qian Ho is pursuing this uh, stretchable version of the HERP, which we call it the SHERP, Stretchable Hybrid Response Pressure Sensor. So here we mounted on an inflatable uh, robotic finger. The inflation would induce about 40% stretching, uh, by active stretching. And we can see that because it is so stretchable and also because it's not very sensitive to stretching, we are able to measure very high uh, uh, capacitance change only after they touch each other. So it's a, a stretch insensitive intrinsically stretchable and highly sensitive pressure sensor. And if we look at this uh, um, zoom in curve, we can clearly see the pulses. Uh, the soft uh, robotic finger is very uh, robust and safe for human interaction. So here we demonstrate that a human moves all the time. After making the initial contact, what if we uh, adjust a little bit? The uh, uh, previously it was pixel five measuring the pulse. Now it's the pixel six measuring the pulse. And uh, he is our aerospace engineering PhD student, uh, which is uh, who is really into this uh, robotic actuation and uh, manipulation. So in summary, uh, the future of mobile health and uh, human center robotics is to try to close the loop. I'm uh, uh, modifying the health schematic here. So for um, human body, we want to perform biomarker sensing, signal processing, data analysis, and uh, um, come up with a medical diagnosis either using uh, artificial intelligence or uh, um, doctors and nurses develop treatment plans and even develop a uh, um, deliver the treatment uh, also using those uh, smart electronics. For the human robot interaction, uh, De Hyun and I wrote this paper um, when soft uh, robotics was uh, first uh, launched. So the robot has to have a uh, human mimetic sensing and uh, using the e scheme, for example, and they have to stimulate the human. So this is a one human robot interface. The human has to process the 
to decode the human, you have to use brain probes and other things. And the human has to control another human-robot interface. And then the robot act, which is the involving soft actuator, and another loop would have to keep running. And then closing the loop should be our future uh, work. So in conclusion, uh, e tattoos are for human wear, whereas e skins are for robot wear. Many soft materials and sensors can find applications in both fields. Bioelectronics interface dictates the e tattoo performance, and e skins are trying to mimic human skin. There are a lot of opportunities lying in mechanics, materials, electronics, bioengineering, data science, and very importantly, their convergence. There are many challenges, but I think most, mostly lying in ourselves. Are we innovative enough? How about privacy? How about ethics? How about your user compliance and so on? But overall, the future of soft electronics is wide and bright. I would like to acknowledge uh, many old and new collaborators over the years, especially Dae Hyung, my um, uh, most uh, published collaborator, and uh, uh, many of my colleagues at UT and uh, medical collaborators and collaborators uh, all over the world and also DOD collaborators. And uh, I stopped collaborating with my um, advisors after I became independent, but I really want to thank them um, for recruiting me, for uh, mentoring me, for supporting me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. And um, my fantastic group and beautiful uh, Austin, Lake Travis, and um, my uh, sponsors. Um, uh, three uh, live e-commercials, I guess. First, uh, we have a faculty opening in our uh, mechanics group right now. The uh, application is still open, and we will review our rolling base. So uh, if you are passionate about mechanics, especially experimental nano mechanics, please uh, apply and uh, we will start the interview uh, in January, February. And uh, second is that in June 2020, um, Ray and Chad are hosting this uh, uh, 19th US National Congress on Theoretical and Applied Mechanics. And, um, Yongju and I are organizing a mini symposia called Mechanics of Flexible, Stretchable, and Bio-Integrated Electronics. We have three fantastic invited speakers who have already confirmed to attend Wei, Xuanhe, and uh, my co And uh, we don't know uh, how this um, pandemic would evolve, but we really hope that we can um, meet you and treat you at Austin with good signs, but also, good Texas barbecue and a large Texas beers. <laughs> and uh, finally, I am an incoming associate editor for Nano Letters, uh, led by Terry and Itzi. And um, we are uh, trying to become the premier nano science communications journal for groundbreaking results. With that, I would like to wrap up and thank everyone for your time and for your uh, friendship, collaboration, and for your attention. Thank you very much. Great. That was a wonderful presentation, Nanshu. It was really, really fantastic, incredible blend of mechanics and materials and manufacturing and medical engineering, and you're really blazing new trails, uh, and I think opening up new opportunities for, for research. And uh, I particularly appreciate your uh, willingness to share so many unpublished results. That was really remarkable. And uh, I think that's very generous of you. So you can give people a sense of where, where you're headed. And it's not just a presentation of uh, previously published results. I think that that was really fantastic as well. So I think we can open things up for questions. I'm sure there are uh, going to be lots of great questions. And so People can just raise their hands uh, and, and we'll call on you in, in sequence uh, and we'll go, go through those questions. But, but maybe I can start with a couple uh, just to maybe get, get things going. So um, I, I guess, um, Nanju, you, you've been focused on uh, skin interface devices, but, but a lot of the underlying materials and mechanics concepts would apply to advanced forms of implantable devices as well. And so, I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, opportunities in, in that space. 
uh, number one. And then number two, uh, you know, a number of people on the call and, you know, in the broader community are very interested in uh, tough conductive hydrogels. And I think those are really exciting classes of materials. And uh, I just also wonder what your thoughts are on their possible role in the, in these kinds of uh, devices, complementary maybe to ultra thin materials as skin interfaces, you know, may, maybe some of these hydrogels have an important role to play as well. So, so those are my two questions. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, John. Indeed, um, there are a lot of uh, uh, mechanics and uh, uh, manufacturing strategies also applicable to uh, invisible and uh, implantable um, bioelectronics. And we have uh, um, Dehyung and uh, uh, a lot of uh, colleagues, uh, Chen Jiang, um, uh, working on those space. I collaborated a lot with uh, Dehyung to look into uh, mechanics challenges. Um, for example, uh, adhesion, right? Uh, on skin, it's dry adhesion. On um, uh, organs, it's wet adhesion. And uh, also, organs have 3D structures. How can we have integumentary epicardial membranes? Uh, those are inspired by uh, our early work with John and later they Hyang use nanomaterials um, to uh, build those uh, mesh uh, membranes. So, um, I think the wet environment uh, gives us a lot of new opportunities because the moisture can enable uh, diffusion and uh, reaction to uh, offer very tough interface adhesions up to a thousand joule per meter square, whereas Vanderwars is only a hundred millijoule per meter square. And uh, um, tough gels applied for uh, a lot of uh, not just uh, sensing but also uh, treatment, uh, drug delivery, uh, and uh, uh, transient um, uh, uh, disappearance. Uh, those kind of applications are, are worth pursuing. And um, also um, for brain uh, sensing, that's a big field, and um, a lot of people are using nanomaterials to uh, achieve uh, a single neuron. Uh, probing, and um, there we need to think about how to deploy uh, electronics in 3D. Um, that's still very challenging, and over a long time, uh, how about the biocompatibility, biofouling, um, those kind of issues. So uh, I don't have the bandwidth really to, to go into uh, implantable electronics, but I am very fortunate to have many collaborators uh, to uh, keep me engaged in this space. Okay, great. Thank, thank you for those thoughtful uh, answers. I appreciate that. So I'm going to have to step out. I'm going to be in and out, but I'm going to hand over the reins to Jimmy. He's going to handle the, the Q&A uh, from this point on, but, but I, I'll be in the background. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have uh, quite a few people raising their hands. Uh, let's start from Tong, Tong Li. Hey, Manshu, wonderful talk. I really enjoy it. And uh, I would uh, 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 concur with uh, uh, John that uh, thank you for sharing a lot of your uh, results, especially those uh, um, unpublished results really give us a, a, a heads up on the, what's really going on at the frontier of this. Uh, I also see you have a upcoming review article from in, in Matter. Looking forward to uh, reading your uh, review papers. Um, so uh, in the past, around I guess around 15 years, you would see a surge of uh, interest and also the progress is in the uh, flexible electronics and soft electronics. Uh, we do have a, a long list of uh, uh, major contributors to this uh, frontier. Many of them are in the in the um, in the panel as well. Now, if you look at the, like many application or problems driven uh, research, I, I do see several things here, uh, mainly three. Uh, application, right? So ap application where the problem you want to address. And then next thing will be the structural design. For example, the structural design of the uh, flexible electronics, um, stretchable electronics, soft electronics. And the number three thing is material, right? The materials to enable the structural design to solve the problem or address the application issues. So I would like to poke your mind, tap on your wisdom. On. Can you, uh, I know you talk about a lot of uh, uh, possibilities in this different aspect. 
can you um, uh, name one major challenge in the three categories if you see this soft electronics, flexible electronics in the next five to 10 years? Materials, structural design, and application. Yeah, so uh, that's a very important question and uh, also a difficult one. So it's uh, just going to be my personal quick answer. Um, so from materials, we know um, organic uh, semiconductors and conductors uh, have been uh, undergone a tremendous uh, development and uh, improvement over the years, including uh, Chenjiang here as a pioneer now, but uh, uh, we also know um, there is still a gap between organic and inorganic electronic performance. So I continue to see uh, this uh, frontier to uh, in, uh, evolve, to be very active and uh, uh, very exciting. Uh, it goes from uh, fundamental um, material synthesis uh, to uh, characterization to device integration. And uh, in terms of the uh, structures, uh, we are constantly looking for uh, more stretchable, more conformable structures. So uh, one example I didn't talk about is um, uh, sometimes, like for the artificial retina example, um, Dehyun and I thought a lot about like how to conform a not so stretchable, uh, but a high density uh, uh, functional device onto a uh, non-zero Gaussian curvature uh, eyeball, right? It's a spherical surface. If it's not stretchable, we cannot make it stretchable because we don't have space to pattern uh, new structures. Then uh, how can we conform a sheet uh, onto a spherical surface without wrinkles or cracks? So there we uh, actually engineered this uh, Kirigami design uh, where we can make a strategic cut um, to enable the, the releasing of the wrinkles and so on. So uh, Kirigami and Origami is uh, becoming emerging structures in flexible and stretchable electronics. And um, uh, like uh, uh, people like uh, um, Han Xing uh, just talked about a lot of them. And uh, in, in, in Jie is another pioneer here. So uh, that's uh, going to be very exciting. Uh, is the last one application? Yeah, the application, yeah. Which application in your mind uh, has uh, the um, most challenge and also the opportunities as well? Yeah, so uh, to me, again, I would uh, uh, love to see a better uh, human machine integration and uh, uh, merging. So from uh, um, processes to uh, augmented capabilities to like uh, socially, uh, social interactions between human and robots, like collaborative collaboration between them or even uh, merging between them, uh, that requires uh, uh, both fundamental and the translational research. And uh, that requires, again, a human to be more like robots and robots to be more like humans. Thank you and congratulations again for your newest uh, recognition. I'm quite sure there are more to come. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, Yong, Yong Zhu. Hi. Hey, Nanshu. Yeah, excellent talk. I, I really enjoyed it um, from, from mechanics to manufacturing to, to the device applications. And, and also congratulations on the, on the Tom Hughes Award and also becoming an associate editor of Nanolators. Um, I, I have, well, I have a lot of questions, but I, I'll ask two quick ones. Uh, the first one is a, is a practical question. Let's say for the, you have graphene, right? On the polymer substrate, you, uh, let's say, well, use the mechanical cutter to cut it, right? So the uh, graphene is, is, is very, very thin. Um, so how is the yield of this, this cutting process? Uh, do you sometimes run into the issue of cutting a substrate? Um, yeah. Second question is, uh, Okay. Yeah. Second is the, when you when you, when you model the skin tattoo interface, right, for the conformability. Yeah, I think very nice uh, mechanics work. Um, so, so I was wondering how you model the uh, the, the skin, right? Uh, do you consider the skin we know has roughness, right? Has the hierarchical roughness. How how do you uh, 
take that into account uh, in your model. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Yong, for those uh, <clears throat> very important and technical uh, questions. So uh, for graphene cutting, uh, we never run into any issue because the uh, graphene uh, has this uh, mechanical robustness. Even though it has uh, some micro cracks, the edge is not very smooth after cutting, but uh, uh, the crack doesn't propagate like a, a brittle fracture, especially when it is supported by a PMMA polymer substrate. So when we look into look under the microscope, we see actually uh, metal uh, like uh, micro cracks, and eventually they coalesce and they rupture. But uh, for a straight uh, graphene on PMMA, uh, it only fully ruptures after 10% uh, strain. So the cutting doesn't uh, induce uh, a lot of uh, um, damage. The, but it's still very tricky to handle. Uh, it's because of the transferring. Um, so it's so thin, right? And uh, when we fish it from liquid, and also when we transfer it onto human skin, uh, a lot of times there is going to be folds, um, wrinkles, uh, cracks um, that would then lead to um, uh, reduced uh, practical applicability. Um, but um, uh, it requires a lot of practice. And now after so many years, uh, we're able to process it with a pretty good yield, both during cutting and during transfer. Um, the second question is about the uh, conformability model for skin. So we model the skin just as a, a linear, elastic, uh, slightly wavy, uh, soft substrate. So in uh, Yonggang previously modeled um, before, but uh, did not consider this partial conformable case. So there is on or off. So we added this partially conformable scenario and uh, added a soft substrate consideration and, uh, but we didn't consider hierarchical um, uh, roughness. We only considered a, a simple sinusoidal roughness. And it's a 2D plain strain model. So even if it's a very simple model, uh, we can see that it is capable to predict the conformability condition pretty well. Uh, so for the ecoflex on skin, the critical thickness is the um, seven microns. Uh, for PMMA and the graphene on skin, because PMMA modulus is much larger than Ecoflex. PMMA is a, a, a few um, gigapascal. The conformability criteria becomes the uh, 550 nanometer. And that guided us to make the 500 nanometer thick uh, graphene beta 2. And uh, again, it showed a very uh, high conformability. So the model really works. And uh, we also considered uh, like wet interface. So uh, for example, Daehyung's early work uh, with the metal uh, filaments uh, conforming to the brain, uh, he showed that uh, only 2.5 micron thick polyimide can fully conform to wet brain surface. Uh, there we have the um, water interface, basically um, twice of water surface uh, energy. And uh, using that interface adhesion, we can also predict the critical uh, conformability thickness is also slightly above uh, two. So those are uh, examples we uh, have included in our uh, recent review paper on matter, uh, which uh, hopefully could appear early next year. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Yeah, I really look thanks, forward yeah. to your to your reading your review paper. Thanks. Great. Uh, Hong Yu, Hong Yu Miao. Uh, hi, Nashu. Uh, congratulations and uh, very inspiring talk. Um, I actually have a sort of a conceptual question. So what would be the most uh, interesting scenario to you um, in a medical setting? Um, I mean, talking about the interactions between human wearing e tattoo and the robots wearing e-skin. Yeah, in, in medical setting, um, if you uh, allow me to dream, I would dream that one day, like in the uh, elderly care facilities, um, the uh, um, old um, people, citizens will be able to be uh, continuously monitored 
uh, they have access to telemedicine because of those uh, wearable uh, medical grade wearable electronics that can continuously monitor their uh, health or manage their disease. Um, they can also be uh, ca uh, taken care by uh, soft uh, nursing robots, uh, which are soft and safe to interact or even manipulate a uh, human body. Um, they can carry patients around. They can um, uh, uh, clean the patient and so on um, and feed the patient. So um, that is the uh, one um, motivation, personal motivation for me uh, because I have a uh, um, close to 100 years old uh, grandparents, uh, three of them. Uh, so they are currently, of course, uh, uh, in those uh, facilities and um, it's um, uh, my parents are, are very uh, busy and <laughs> they cannot visit me um, because they have to take care of my grandparents. So uh, aging is going to be a big uh, motivation and driving force for all of this. Oh, that, that's wonderful because uh, uh, I'm about to say that welcome to the aging research field. <laughs> and and when, you, when you are still young, you start thinking about aging. Okay, that's really wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank you. We can talk about this later. Okay. Yes, yes. Thanks, Yeah. Okay, Robin. Hi, Nigel. Very nice talk. I really enjoy that. So here at Northeastern, we have a bunch of active uh, faculties and uh, students. Uh, uh, we constantly talk about all the different kinds of applications of human machine interface, how to internet different things and materials. Now, uh, uh, constantly we have we have one question in mind that I really want to see your opinion and maybe other uh, researchers here. That is the energy source for these sensing technologies and the other applications. Now, uh, I saw in one of your demonstrations, you have the, um, you have the little battery for your device. Uh, what about uh, uh, harvesting the energy from the human motion or you know, all the other environmental factors? Is there any, uh, for example, triple electric or others, uh, uh, are there any uh, challenging uh, uh, things to solve there? And uh, are there any uh, exciting opportunities currently existing? That's my first question. I'll wait for your answer now. Yeah, uh, energy is uh, always a bottleneck for us. So you are absolutely right. And, um, and now we can uh, even design the e tattoo as small as a, a micro SD card. Uh, but the battery is still three micro SD cards large. So dominating all the thickness, the stiffness uh, and the space. So um, of course uh, there are a lot of active research in energy harvesting and um, there are even journals uh, trying to focus on this space. Uh, we haven't worked on this space, but um, we know, for example, um, piezoelectric uh, motion energy harvesters uh, are could be very soft, very thin, um, could have high voltage, but a limited current and therefore very limited power. Mm, we can also have uh, uh, thermoelectrics uh, doing thermal energy harvesting and tribal electrics also doing motion harvesting, but usually they require multi-layer uh, scrubbing or contacting each other, so it's a little bit thick. Uh, maybe it's better to mount them on um, fabrics and uh, uh, clothes rather than directly on the skin. Um, uh, in the double E field, actually, there is also very active efforts uh, related to wireless energy harvesting. So we are all surrounded by a lot of electromagnetic uh, waves and uh, fields. So um, how to uh, really uh, use those wasted uh, energy just uh, in the air, basically. So, um, uh, or or how can we bounce energy back inside a room uh, just from a source uh, all the way to the wearables and um, even mobile devices? Um, uh, my group is also trying to uh, develop a wearable charger that can wirelessly charge uh, our cell phones or even uh, our. E tattoos. 
but the eta tubes are distributed uh, across the body, right, from the head to toe, then how can we wirelessly charge individual one of them um, uh, with a good efficiency and a good target if we want to just do specifically one by one? So those, those are a lot of interesting uh, ECE questions, and we have to collaborate with ECE people uh, to really tackle yeah. those kind of difficulties. But uh, Kejie is gone. I, I think uh, Kejie will uh, be able to give us a lot of advice, um, like uh, batteries and uh, uh, mechanic, uh, chemo mechanics in batteries. So uh, if you have any uh, work in this uh, field, uh, feel free to share with us. We would love to have a solution. Thank you. The major driving force here at North Eastland is also from ECE people on this. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, uh, my second question, since you, 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 uh, you mentioned this aging challenge, now thinking about this, um, human-machine interface isn't uh, only um, human skin and the machines, right? But also, I would imagine environment, for instance, at a senior's room, uh, if we could place all the sensors surrounding, we could sense, for example, when they fell, uh, how do they fell, right? How did they fall? Uh, things like this. So uh, what's my question is, compared to um, the uh, devices that currently you are building and others build on skins and on the uh, organs, what's the different challenges there? For example, if I want to distribute the sensors and devices in the environment, Oh, yeah, uh, the, currently the Internet of Things and the smart home are, are really uh, taking up speed, right? Uh, we can have, uh, I think a lot of uh, Chinese families already have a surveillance camera inside and outside of their apartments or homes, right? So uh, using camera, we can uh, track babies, uh, elderly seniors uh, very effectively. Um, but um, what I want to emphasize is uh, not everything has to be put on skin. Um, a, a lot of times uh, people ask me, how about the environmental sensor? I say, why do you need it on skin? Put it on your shirt as a pink, that's it. <laughs> so, so the reason we need on skin uh, electronic tattoos is uh, for this uh, most intimate but non-invasive uh, interfacing with uh, the uh, body, right? The skin surface carry a lot of uh, um, uh, internal signals like electrical, thermal, uh, even chemical uh, biomarkers. And that's why we need, we have to put the sensors on the skin. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can have environment like humidity and the temperature sensor just as next installed in our room. And we have, we, we can have uh, like a smart um, mattress uh, monitoring the sleep quality, the motion, uh, and maybe smart pillow, a smart shoes. Uh, so everything can be smart, and uh, that's the internet of everything. So um, in ECE, there is this uh, um, also edge computing uh, emerging. So uh, we can put a lot of uh, computational uh, tasks at those sensors. Uh, so that we only have to collect the most important conclusions um, and save bandwidth and save power. Thank you. Great. Uh, I see John is back. Uh, as host, please feel free to jump in <laughs> because you can provide a lot of uh, uh, extremely interesting perspectives. Uh, no, it's great. Nanchu is doing a fantastic job answering questions on her own. I'll, I'll pipe in if I see an opportunity. Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, Dae Hyang? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, excellent and inspiring talk. Uh, it was a really nice summary of the uh, biointegrated electronics from the beginning of the skin, skin epitomal electronics to development of the materials and device designs and and even including the future of the human machine interface. So it was really inspiring. I learned a lot. And I have a, a I have two quick questions. The first one is you presented a smart idea for the wiring uh, between the uh, graphene tattoo and the uh, gold ultra thin gold serpentine wires. And uh, uh, as far as I understood uh, the contact was made by the uh, Bandabara sport. Uh, 
but since the uh, area between the wired uh, wiring, old wiring and the E tattoo is not much, uh, I'm not sure how low robust the uh, contact is. So uh, can you uh, briefly make a comment on that? Uh, that? That is the first question. And the second question is about the uh, uh, cut and paste process. Uh, I feel that that is very practical. So if we can use uh, various kinds of uh, commercialized films, uh, you mentioned uh, metal device films, but maybe we can expand the material from uh, just metal to the semiconductor side, uh, IgGO or other polymer materials. So various kinds of thin films can be deposited on the uh, uh, plastic foil and maybe you can uh, apply cut and paste uh, process to integrate different materials to make a heterogeneously integrated devices. So, and uh, uh, so that has a very uh, high potential. Uh, and my question is, is there any uh, idea or plan to um, modify the process to be more compatible with the uh, mass production? Uh, maybe you can uh, integrate your uh, cut and paste process with the roll to roll uh, process uh, uh, and so on. And that can be uh, uh, closer to the commercialization. Yes, yes. So um, thanks for the very thoughtful uh, questions. Uh, first, regarding the uh, uh, graphene gold uh, contact, indeed, it is uh, just a vendor worth contact, but Remember, it's a, a full conformability. So uh, their uh, uh, effective contact area is uh, actually much better than just the rigid, rigid contact because the, it, the graphene also conforms to the uh, granular structure of gold. And um, we are using uh, actually a, a millimeter wide serpentine because it was on palm, we have some space. So the, each serpentine ribbon is actually quite uh, uh, wide and the, uh, the overlap is like half of a period. So I, um, I can check, but I don't have the contact uh, resistance in mind, but uh, we did a, a circuit model comparing the uh, interface, uh, electrographing skin interface impedance, the gold PI skin interface impedance, the contact impedance um, and the resistance of graphene. And we can prove that the signal we measure are uh, majority, uh, majority of the signal coming from just the electrodermal activity. And that is something we have uh, carefully uh, looked into. Um, the, the, the surprise to us is the graphene never slides against the gold uh, once it conforms to go that it, it, it actually has the just a very uh, mature, like permanent uh, contact area. So um, the second question is the, the scaling up of the cut and paste. It's hard, uh, I, I tr uh, try to do it and I even uh, uh, try to apply for budgets to do it. Um, but later we realized that um, if we can leverage the uh, industry capability uh, of the flexible printed circuit FPC, uh, we don't have to even build the multi-layer ETA2. Uh, the multi-layer gives us some uh, recyclability and uh, um, uh, disassembly uh, capability, right? Uh, modular uh, capability, reconfigurability. But uh, and the price is, uh, the most important price is uh, human uh, time. Right? So uh, in the future, I think uh, automation is also a big part of industry 4.0. And actually during the pandemic, uh, right, uh, uh, automation uh, expanded dramatically because uh, um, I think uh, uh, machines cannot contract uh, coronavirus. Right? So um, uh, currently there is also already automated process to build a flexible circuit. And uh, that's why now we are actually uh, pursuing just a stretchable flexible circuit. Um, we can uh, order those uh, FPCs from the vendor and then uh, we can solder by ourselves or we can even ask the vendor to do the assembly once we finalize the design. And then we can build hundreds or thousands of them 
and uh, we can. Uh, that's what John did, I believe. He is deploying thousands of those units in Africa now. So I think that's the way if we really want to scale up and deploy. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Ying? Ying Li? Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Nanshu. So uh, fascinating talk, really inspiring. In particular, I can imagine your e-skin and e-tattoo will be everywhere in the near future. So I have two related questions. So, so the one is, you know, since we're going to use them a lot, so how about this long-lasting issue? You know, like uh, Zhigang and Xuan He, they're working on the fatigue of the hydrogels and uh, similar thing, uh, you know, for this e-tattoo or the e-skin. And in particular, you consider the different uh, uh, or the extreme environment uh, requirement, like extreme hot, extreme cold, extreme wet, extreme dry. And extreme is there any particular mechanics. issue? Yeah, extreme mechanics. So <laughs> <laughs> have you ever considered, you know, uh, any particular harsh situation like this? Yeah, so um, that, that's uh, wonderful. And uh, ETA2, so uh, could be uh, currently with the uh, optimized mechanical design and uh, optimized interface adhesion. Uh, it could be worn for more than uh, a week. I think John has, uh, has worn more than, I think five weeks or something. So um, that is uh, because the strain uh, actually on the skin surface is only up to like 60% at the joints. If you are talking about the chest, uh, like a chest patch. Uh, with very muscular uh, subject to maybe more than 20%, but normally just a few percent. Yeah. So um, it's not a large strain uh, challenge like sometimes in hydrogels, they have to have soft actuation and uh, uh, over large uh, uh, strain or surf covering large surfaces. So uh, therefore, uh, ETA2 is not a big issue, except, of course, the hard soft interfaces uh, that's always a challenge and in the past i cited a few uh, quotes from the literature so there were a lot of ideas proposed to to solve this uh, reliability issue between soft and hard using like a, a gradient of stiffness uh, or using multi-layer approach um, so uh, ultimately we think uh, okay can we also leverage serpentine um, to, to, to do this. And that's how we came up with the heterogeneous uh, serpentine contact. And there, uh, it's the first time we can make graphene tattoo uh, go completely ambulatory. We had a lot of activities, driving, studying, sleeping, and it survived all of that. So um, of course, uh, fatigue, uh, usually you're talking about uh, 10,000, 100,000 of times. Uh, we haven't clear, very carefully looked into that. Uh, it's very uh, tough um, uh, experimental job. Um, uh, and I was uh, uh, actually trying to uh, avoid it. But uh, ultimately, uh, if we are ready to uh, talk about uh, deployment and uh, uh, product uh, development and uh, um, uh, patient wearing, then all of those issues uh, cannot be avoided. But we also hope that uh, in industry, uh, actually, probably they are more um, qualified than us uh, to, to, to look into those kind of, uh, they have good uh, instruments, they have good training, um, product design and reliability are big issues, quality control, are our big uh, topics for uh, industry, but not so much for academia. Um, so we have to learn from sure. the industry uh, yeah. to, to really uh, uh, do it in a smart way. Of course, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And the following one is uh, like, we are in the electronic age these days. You have computers, the cell phones, you know, everything, you know, all the electronics. So that come up the issue. Uh, we have a lot of electronic waste, right? So the government have a very strict regulation on the waste of the electronics. So do you foresee in the near future, we have to worry about the e-tattoo uh, you know, issue uh, or similar issue? Uh, 
uh, I am not sure if because if you consider the volume of E tattoo, it's so thin sure. and uh, so small. So it's not, I haven't done the calculation carefully, but uh, okay. it's not at a scale as the uh, like uh, cell phones and uh, um, uh, laptops, those kind of electronics. But of course, if uh, in the future, long future, we're talking about like uh, everybody wearing more than 10 e tattoo uh, <laughs> and then they have to change every week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then there we, are, we, we have to be very careful about uh, like sustainability and sure. uh, eco friendly and but uh, don't forget uh, I'm not working on it but there's a big field of transient electronics oh, yeah. uh, from awesome. uh, conductors to <laughs> semiconductors to dielectrics to encapsulation everything can be biodegradable and sure. uh, can can be uh, can disappear by itself. Sure. Um, we also need to uh, consider manufacturing. Um, uh, can we? Uh, those are not easy to scale if you think about it, uh, right? It's still in the lab and um, still a uh, manual process. But how do we have a scalable uh, echo manufacturing? I think that's also a topic NSF really cares yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, congratulations again for all your achievement and the recent words. And look forward Thanks, to more Yin. coming. Yeah. Thanks, Yin. Great, great. Uh, Chun Jiang. Sure. So, Nansu, thank you so much for the fantastic talk. It is very inspiring and give a very good summary of uh, your research and also probably more than your research, but in the whole field of uh, soft electronics, tattoo uh, electronics. So, uh, I actually have uh, uh, two uh, questions. Uh, pretty much relate to the cut pace, which I think is very uh, interesting and it's very uh, useful. So the first thing is regarding the, the uh, <clears throat> relate to the mechanics, which coming from the manufacturing point of view, if you try to compare uh, <clears throat> the nisography, which using you know, developing process, it's a wet process, uh, from the features point of view, they're actually smooth out any sharp colors or you know, uh, edges which is beneficial for a stress concentration once you mechanically deform them. But uh, from uh, you know, this uh, cut paste, mechanic cutting, that might lead to the uh, sharp corners. So uh, do you have any comments that how this process being eventually being improved or from some other ways that making uh, you know, this problem, maybe if there's any uh, challenges associated with the approach, how you might uh, uh, improve that. The second one is, uh, <clears throat> I think you show a, a beautiful result in terms of uh, conductive materials, like a graphene or some other material systems to making bioelectronics. But if you look into uh, those uh, nanomaterials, for example, uh, some of the uh, you know, TMD, semiconducting materials, right? And from electronic point of view, if you look into those soft electronics or bioelectronics, uh, not just the conductors, those uh, from electric point of view, I call them passive electronics. But if you look into active electronics, diodes, transistors, you know, uh, other you know different types of modules, sensors. So they are actually uh, uh, more than a conductor, which are uniformly uh, across in the whole. Basically, they form the same pattern of the serpentine, for example. But if you look into those uh, transistor diodes, some of the materials they are being just selective, have certain patterns in plan. So is there a way this uh, cut path can be implemented or can be directly utilized for cutting material, not cutting through the multiple layer, but just uh, across a certain, you know, very tiny or thin layer of the material to creating patterns. That way you can directly need to manufacturing active electronics. Yeah, so that's yeah, the yeah. Two questions. Right, uh, so those are very deep questions and a very, um, useful for discussion. So first about like the uh, edges and the uh, um, um, smoothness of the edges. So indeed, uh, when we do, okay, depending on what the cutter you're using, if you're using the mechanical cutter, it's a very rough edge. Um, if you're using laser cutter, uh, it could be uh, much smoother and laser cutting is widely used for printed circuit board rapid prototyping already. So um, 
when we have those inevitable uh, roughness at the edge, actually from mechanics point of view, uh, the best way to reduce the uh, corner strain concentration or singularity actually sometimes is to do encapsulation. If you can passivate the edge, um, previously it was a three space uh, like a island substrate air, but if you can fill that air by some kind of a, a polymer with some stiffness, uh, that can very effectively reduce the singularity at the corner or, or at the um, irregular boundary. So, um, uh, and a lot of times we, we do need to um, passivate and uh, encapsulate our devices. Even after cut and paste, we still have to do that. Um, uh, but uh, ultimately, um, uh, I think those kind of uh, uh, edges will, will give us trouble during fatigue, uh, even after passivation. That, that's very true. Um, we haven't looked at more than 10,000 times, for example, so we haven't suffered from that yet. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a very important question, very insightful. Um, the second question is uh, about uh, uh, integrating uh, active uh, ETA tools using kind of things. Um, that, that's uh, one thing we probably have to collaborate with you. Um, we don't work on like our own active uh, transistors or diodes, um, but uh, there's uh, this uh, ITO uh, serpentine I showed, and I mentioned that we cannot cut ITO. But the ITO uh, serpentine was made by cut and paste. How did we do it? Is that uh, we first have the PET substrate. We first cut the substrate, but without removing any part, we do the ITO deposition. Because ITO is so thin, right? Only 100 nanometer, like similar to, to your active material, they're very thin, you can do deposition. Then after the deposition, we can peel away the PET. And uh, all the materials deposited on top of the PET are peeled away. And uh, that's how we have this uh, ITO without doing cut and paste, but still using cut and paste. So, um, but for a lot of uh, organic materials, for example, um, there are some solution process and uh, we haven't explored any web process in cut and paste. But it will be very interesting, uh, I, I agree. And now we have a, a very nice uh, laser cutter and we can uh, have higher resolution and smoother edges. Thank you. And congratulations again on the Tom Hughes Young Investigator Award and also many is to come, I believe. Thanks, congratulations to you too about many things. Okay, very good. Xue uh, Zhu? Uh, so then she a uh, great talk. So my question is actually regarding the adhesion between devices and the surfaces that they are applied to. So um, I think depending on the type of devices and the surfaces or their applications, I saw people use, for example, rely on Van der Waals forces or a thin layer of uh, adhesive for skin electronics and also the immersing, for example, uh, hydrogels, uh, including non-conductive non -conductive and uh, conductive ones, uh, for especially for in vivo uh, 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 studies. Mm, so uh, I also saw people, I mean, uh, engineer the uh, structures of the interface, for example, by using kurigami, origami to enhance the adhesion. So my question is, uh, would you uh, comment on the selection or development of uh, this adhesion for uh, different types of application. Uh, probably this involves uh, mechanics, materials, and uh, probably structures. Right, right. So uh, interfaces always are challenging, right? And uh, every interface uh, gives us uh, trouble. Uh, whether mechanical trouble or electrical trouble, right? The moving artifacts all come from interface issues. 
uh, the contact impedance, right? So um, that's a very broad question, and um, we have uh, uh, been exploring actually some of those the reversible adhesives between the tattoos and the human skin um, because we want to reuse a lot of those electronics. Um, but uh, we looked into um, very popular gecko inspired uh, micro pillar based uh, physically enhanced adhesives. And um, it, it has been widely explored by Professor Edward Arts, uh, Professor Hua Jing Gao, and many, many pioneers. Um, but uh, uh, later, De Hyang engineered this uh, micro uh, craters on the uh, polymer surface inspired by um, octopus. So we started to look into the mechanics of uh, micro surface craters. Um, and uh, later on, there are many other follow-up work um, demonstrating extraordinary adhesion uh, performance between um, both the like both the uh, crater surfaces, both under dry and wet conditions. Um, but uh, we we looked into like how suction was generated, uh, how it can be enhanced during structural material uh, engineering. But uh, unfortunately, we were not very successful in um, uh, really achieving high adhesion because uh, we don't know how to like really uh, uh, purge the uh, fluid or air very well uh, during the loading process. So um, that is something we are still uh, puzzled and we're still trying to um, uh, uh, find a solution for. But uh, uh, that is for dry adhesion, right? For wet adhesion, um, there are already a lot of uh, achievements. Uh, uh, even uh, people here, Yu Hang and uh, Robin, working on hydrogels can tell you uh, much more about those. Uh, but ultimately, I think the answer is uh, it really uh, has to be suitable uh, for the interface. Uh, by suitable, I mean on the west, one hand, it has to uh, provide enough adhesion for whatever purpose. Uh, but also, uh, on the other hand, can we leverage the environment to promote adhesion? Uh, like in the wet environment, there could be chemical cracks linking, diffusion cracks linking, and so on. On the dry surfaces, um, we mostly leverage just uh, either um, uh, silicone adhesives, uh, acrylic adhesives, or just uh, um, those uh, uh, physically engineered adhesives. Uh, between thin films, um, uh, there are a lot of a lot more materials uh, uh, studies that we can do. For example, uh, gold doesn't bond to polyimid very well, but if you add uh, titanium or chromium, uh, the adhesion can be promoted. Right. So uh, adhesion is also very important during manufacturing. Um, um, the, the micro transfer printing it has been a, a field that has been studied uh, a lot. So there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> room for mechanicians to contribute. Thank you. Also, congratulations you. again for your achievement. And also, thank you for the role model you, ha you have built for females. Thank you, Shiji. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Yu Hong? Thank you, Jimmy. Hey, Nanshu, as always, yeah. a wonderful talk, a wonderful work. Yeah, so um, I think uh, you may have already answered my question from uh, the previous uh, um, uh, question. So, um, uh, so I also wanted to uh, go back to the uh, overall uh, uh, problems that Tong brought uh, in the beginning, but I want to add uh, the fourth arm to it. So this is a mechanics community. So um, I was wondering, uh, what do you think is uh, the biggest uh, uh, opportunity in this field uh, for new mechanics in the future. Uh, you have uh, e from uh, the past uh, uh, your work, uh, uh, Yung Gang's work and many uh, mechanisms, uh, beautiful work uh, in this field. Uh, but just the projecting in the future step back with all these issues and also uh, future um, uh, development in this field. What do you think uh, could be the biggest uh, opportunity for mechanics? Uh, people to um, 
think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, thanks, Yuhang. And I think um, uh, you are a good example to your own question. <laughs> so there is a lot of uh, uh, new mechanics in emerging uh, soft materials, um, polymers, uh, gels, and their interfaces, and they're uh, interfacing with the bio tissue or with the uh, stiff materials. Um, that has been explored uh, quite a lot. And uh, there is also emerging area of uh, uh, using machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence for uh, materials and structural design. And um, I, Yin Li just uh, gave two wonderful talks at the UT Austin, uh, giving us examples uh, how to use the, those computational tools uh, to guide future uh, material uh, genome, basically for polymer. Uh, what we are exploring currently are just a small fraction of uh, the enormous possibilities. Uh, and the human uh, are too limited. Uh, machines can do much better than us. That's why we need to become machines or merge with machines. Um, and uh, of course, um, another example I, I am trying to think is our uh, pressure sensor. So um, currently we only tuned the carbon nanotube doping. We have not uh, tuned the, the uh, structure of the foam. Uh, there's a lot of mechanics uh, in the porous material already. But there's, we looked a lot. There's not enough uh, modeling work related to the electromechanical coupled um, uh, theories for this kind of uh, like barely conductive, uh, both piezo resistive and piezo capacitive uh, foams. And you can even think about an architected foam um, where you have the full control of the design of the uh, structure. And then plus your doping. Um, tunability, then you have a very wide space to play with uh, in the electromechanical performance of those uh, foams. And for future pressure sensors, actually, when I gave a talk at the uh, U of uh, Connected, uh, Xue Zhu asked a very important question. So um, how to like choose the right pressure sensor for the right application? There is no universal answer. There's no universal uh, solution. Um, some of them have a, a just need a very high sensitivity, like a measuring pulses. Um, you don't need a very large pressure range. But uh, if you are uh, trying to uh, manipulate human or hold a human uh, as a robot, then that's a lot of pressure. And uh, you still want a soft sensor, but the soft sensor should be sensitive uh, over very large pressure range then you need a completely different structure with completely different mechanical properties. But in the meanwhile, how about your electromagnetic, uh, uh, electromechanical behavior? Not a very well modeled. Uh, so I think the coupling between uh, multiple physics, uh, mechanics is just one of the physics. Uh, you guys are doing a lot of uh, chemo-mechanical coupling. So I think that is the future. Uh, mechanics is just uh, our um, tool, and uh, we grow out of it. Thank you, Nanshu. Wonderful. Uh, Jin, Jen, Jayin. Okay. Uh, hi. That's a wonderful talk. So as always, I enjoy it. Um, so my question actually following Chen question. So about a cut and paste, right? So you mentioned the Krigami things that approach a uh, cutting approach. Uh, so I saw the Chen Jiang this year in the published your paper about this uh, uh, using the Krigami method, right, the, uh, to the curve the electronics. So can you comment on the say the benefit or advantage and also disadvantage of this, uh, you know, Krigami approach to the especially to the curve the electronics? So I would love to see the. You know these uh, applications uh, in the in broader uh, with a broad impact. Thank you. Yes, yes, you have done a lot of work already, and we are learning from your papers for sure. So um, ultimately, I think that we also have to uh, borrow on artificial intelligence and machine learning because 
um, uh, entirely like artificial retinas, the perfectly a spherical surface, right? That's already uh, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, things to play with. But if you think about human body, whether it's the skin surface or the internal organs, it's irregular 3D surfaces. Yes. And um, of course, the stretchable materials can wrap nicely, can conform. Um, but if you have a high density devices, um, you don't have a lot of real estate to design stretchability. In that case, um, how can we really uh, conform to those kind of 3D surface? There's uh, no good solution. There is a professor in Stony Brook, Professor uh, Xian Feng Hu. He's a, a mathematician and a computer science professor, but uh, he has been mapping um, geometries onto 3D surfaces like a car or a rabbit uh, using uh, math and computational tools. And uh, he doesn't consider so much about the elasticity and bending and stretching energy, artificial energy, so on. But there is a big field uh, in computer science that people are trying to conform um, patterns onto arbitrary 3D surfaces. And if um, mechanicians can collaborate with them um, to uh, in incorporate those uh, um, different uh, deformation interfacial energies, um, I think, uh, and then of course, the leveraging computational uh, capabilities, uh, I think it's going to be a, a very new field um, where kirigami meets with the uh, geometry and uh, computer science. Okay, thank you. So what, one more question. So how can you quantify, right, so conformability? So uh, let's, yeah. Yeah, so uh, for the skin surface, uh, um, the best you can do is to ju just to have a very qualitative argument, like you can see, right? Especially for graphene, it's transparent. We can see whether it's conformable or not. Um, but for like a, a spherical surface, we're having another project uh, where we just have a transparent membrane with a, a dyed ink. And when we drain the ink, uh, the membrane conforms to the spherical surface. And because of the transparency and the ink is dark, so we can see the um, adhesion front, the frontiers of adhesion, and then we can calculate the conformability. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Very good, Yan, Yan Fei? Yeah, well, uh, I guess that could be the last one, right? <laughs> there are no more raised hands. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, I would like to have a question, or probably this is more like a comment. Uh, this is not only for Nan Shu, but also for Jiang, for many other people here. So most of your, uh, you guys have been trying, well, this is on the topic of uh, bonding, adhesion, or conformability, whatever you are talking about. So most of you are actually relying on uh, a simple elastic analysis, contact analysis, adhesive contact, or maybe some fracture analysis. But basically you're doing elastic plus adhesive contact to make sure things are bound together. But you know, from engineering processing point of view, there are at least two huge categories of processing tools or methods that can bound things together. One is uh, in the ceramics uh, community, that's the sintering, right? So you have the reduction of the boundary energy to drive, and the kinetics is by diffusion mostly. And the other uh, huge application is on welding. In welding, of course, if you melt things, uh, fusion welding, that's totally different. There's a lot of uh, solid state bonding, so, or joining. So you don't really need to melt the material, but you need to have a high temperature and also pressure to bond the things together. Now, regardless of whether you're talking about the ceramic sintering or metallic uh, solid state bonding, the key idea is, is usually uh, at high temperature diffusion or transport that drives the bonding to happen. And um, have you or John Rogers, Jimmy Shia, many, many of those people, have you ever thinking about extending your methodology to such huge uh, capability rather than relying on elastic adhesive contact? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, because we don't like high temperature. <laughs> so so uh, I personally have not, but uh, you know, nowadays there are a lot of uh, 3D printing of metal uh, efforts going on, right? So the selective uh, centering actually uh, initiated from Austin. Um, I would leave the question to John. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I'll offer a couple of thoughts. So um, just to echo Nanshu's comments, um, you know, I think we prefer chemical bonding rather than centering or high temperature diffusion, given the um, you know, diverse materials and low thermal budgets associated with, uh, you know, a lot of these types of devices. So uh, that that's generally the strategy is to try to think about chemical interactions to drive interfacial bonding. So it doesn't have to be just van der Waals or generalized adhesion forces. It could be actual covalent bonds forming between material level, uh, layers. Just as a simple example, with uh, a common elastomer that's used in these um, devices, polydimethylsiloxane, you can um, functionalize the surface to um, have exposed hydroxyl groups, OH groups. And so if you take two PDMS surfaces that are um, functionalized in that way, upon contact, a dehydration reaction or condensation reaction will occur whereby uh, a water molecule will be produced uh, as a consequence of an SIO, SI bond forming. And that turns out to be really effective. Uh, it can you know, occur at room temperature and you end up with a uh, bonded joint that fails cohesively. I mean, the interface is sometimes stronger than the constituent materials themselves. So it's one example of many that um, you know, we prefer to use in these systems. That, that's one comment. The other comment uh, would be to uh, you reflect on you know, your, your thoughts around welding. And um, you know, welding doesn't have to occur at, at high temperatures. So uh, yeah. gold in particular uh, will weld to itself at room temperature. So gold, gold, cold welding is, is a pretty well-known uh, metallur metallurgic uh, pro process, and, and we'll use that kind of strategy as well in certain instances. It, it can work uh, extremely effectively uh, also, and so certain forms of welding, I guess, would, would be uh, relevant, and gold, gold, cold welding would be an example of that. And then the third uh, thought, and, and it's something that we haven't explored, but, but I think it uh, is a, a frontier area in this um, you know, space of uh, managing interfaces is that with uh, high high power pulse lasers, you can create extremely high uh, changes in temperature very locally at at surfaces of materials. So, for example, um, James M at Columbia University has a uh, a laser based process by which he can recrystallize amorphous silicon films on plastic substrates without melting the underlying plastic. Uh, because of the extreme surface localization associated with the um, strong absorption of these short pulsed lasers. So you can heat the silicon up to many hundreds of degrees without melting the underlying polymers. So there may be some you know, really interesting strategies where you can sort of manage yeah. high temperature thermal processes for interface bonding in a way that's still compatible with all the organic materials used in these uh, devices. And we've been thinking about that specifically in the context of edge seal for uh, implantable devices, where you really need a hermetic seal around the, uh, around the electronics. And, uh, you know, it needs to serve as a biofluid barrier that's stable for, you know, decades, you know, for a permanent implant. And that might be a strategy because the chemical bonding techniques don't work as effectively in those extreme sort of uh, conditions and, and for those very challenging requirements. Anyway, it's a great, great question. Yeah, just yeah. and uh, let, me, let me add just one thing. So uh, good points, great points. So uh, we have uh, just something uh, similar. So we use a uh, pulse laser uh, mm -hmm. to assist the, the cold welding of uh, silver or nanowires. So interesting, <laughs> you mentioned something similar. So mm -hmm. our paper is almost done. I'm, we are going to send this to Nan Shu's uh, journal. And to uh -huh. see uh, to see our hope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, John. Thank you, Anishu, particularly. Yeah. in January. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, January okay. is just two weeks. Very yeah. quick. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a question. So let me ask the last question. Uh, I'm trying to push the uh, frontier or to push the boundary to the extreme. 
uh, Manchu, you showed one of your first pictures is a half human, half robot. You, you've been talking about merging. So far, what I'm hearing is we have, for example, we started from flexible electronics. We have wearable electronics now. We have John, you know, is developing embedded electronics. All these things are one-sided. You are putting electronics, putting these man-made devices into a biological system. Let me push it a little bit further. I haven't heard that anybody is developing or growing in biological systems on a ro robot. In other words, embedding uh, biology into uh, a machinery or something like that. I don't know whether this would be uh, something that in the future we're going to do. I think I'm, I'm seeking uh, comments, perspectives, advices from wise people like you, Nanchu, and and uh, uh, Zhang, and all the other you know the people over here. Have people thought about that? Uh, just a quick comment. Full integration. Go ahead. Uh, just a quick people. comment. That's a, that's a great uh, thought. Uh, I just uh, read some uh, news that people can now uh, manufacture uh, mini robots that can that can proliferate, just like a cell. Reproduce themselves. Yeah. Okay. Proliferate. Very good. Very good. Yeah. That's one of the functions. Uh, of I don't know. I don't know if that's triggered by the human device interactions, but definitely that's a way to mimic the uh, human cells. You know the proliferation, right? Self proliferation and self patterning. This kind of wonderful uh, self assembly kind of uh, techniques that our living materials have that we probably don't have much in a material synthesis. Machines making machine themselves. Yes. They can have their daughters, sons, etc. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think one example I can think of is, of course, that John has uh, grown those cells on the pop-up uh, 3D uh, scaffolds. And uh, there you can even grow organoids or embryos. And uh, if it's stretchable, right, the purpose of Jaleo is to try to um, push this idea. If they are stretchable, they can even uh, expand and uh, grow and uh, integrate with uh, the embryo and all the way from embryo to uh, adults, right? And you just have permanently uh, integrated electronics uh, with the uh, neurons and uh, um, other nerves and so on. So uh, it is a field that people are exploring. That's a wonderful um, idea, actually. And that's just a, my um, things I could think of. John could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just add to that. I mean. I guess it's an area that we're interested in, uh, many others as well. I think G. Lu was on the call earlier and uh, a former PhD student of mine as a postdoc in his group showed an ability to uh, you know, integrate these mesh-like deformable electronics into organoids by, by growing the tissue around the, uh, the structure, uh, which is pretty interesting. And I think Janan Bao's group has shown similar types of ideas, but in the context of, I guess, what you're referring to, Nanshu, uh, the, the development of embryos and, uh, you know, integrating electronics at that point, and then uh, the system grows in, in concert with the devices. I, I don't know, you know, it's an interesting question to ask, you know, to what extent is the device altering the natural biology that develops in those contexts? And, uh, I know it's a little bit disturbing to think about what the ultimate organism <laughs> look like if you embed electronics at the embryonic stage. I, I don't know, pro probably like bad things would happen, <laughs> I guess. But anyway, it's an interesting area. 
Tahir was on uh, earlier, and uh, as you probably know, Jimmy, there's a lot of uh, work in these biobots where you uh, grow mm -hmm. muscle tissues and you integrate them with man-made frameworks and control electronics. And uh, we have a couple of NSF-funded programs with um, uh, Rashid Bashir and uh, Tahir and Mattia Gazola and others at uh, UIUC. So we're doing the soft electronics. They're doing the biology parts, and you put them together, and you can do some pretty crazy things. So we actually have uh, wirelessly controlled robots that operate on the basis of um, optogenetically stimulated contractions of um, preformed muscle tissues that are sort of integrated, you know, with the electronics. And, uh, you know, my postdoc got uh, very, very deep into this. And so you can actually take a game controller now and wirelessly control robots in kind of a swarm and they like play games and stuff, weird, you know, hybrid robots. So I would say it's an area that's developing rapidly, but maybe one where, you know, the applications are not terribly clear. I, I don't know what you do with this stuff. But anyway, you know, as an academic exploratory, you know, research program, I think it's kind of interesting. And there are others who are doing that sort of thing as well. Yeah, the hybrid system that you're talking about. Uh, hybrid, I think, yeah, hybrid. Uh, Right. And uh, most people are using that as, for example, using uh, uh, cardiomyocytes or uh, yeah. muscle cells yeah. as uh, something to drive a machinery, right? Kit Parker. Yeah. That, 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 uh, yeah. But uh, more and more, they're you know combining uh, different uh, cell types. So cardiomyocytes or, or let's say mu muscle cells with neurons. So you actually have an artificially formed neuromuscular junction. And I think that kind of direction be, begins to be even more interesting because then you can think about learned behavior, you know, where, where the neurons are, are providing some kind of mechanism for training of complex, you know, uh, sequences of contractions and motions. And that, that opens up a whole new, new frontier that, that looks pretty, pretty exciting. Potentially. Indeed. Indeed. Living Indeed. a robot. Yeah, I'm living a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very good. Okay, so uh, we reached the end of uh, another exciting and a very exciting uh, EML webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Namshu, for, for this wonderful talk. And uh, again, congratulations uh, for your uh, Tom Hughes Young Investigator Award. Uh, let me end this with uh, the last thing that uh, I want to show. Uh, this is to everybody, a very happy new year and a great, great holiday season. And let's all thank Namshu uh, for a wonderful talk and thank John for, for hosting this uh, uh, EML webinar. Yep, thanks we'll Jimmy, thanks Namshu. We'll see Thanks you next that. year <laughs> with see more you next year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy right. New year. Thank Bye -bye. you so Bye. much, everyone. Okay. I'll Bye. hope to hopefully see you in the future. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks, Tan. Thanks, everyone. No problem. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Daniel.